It's time. We are here for the final, 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 final tier list. I swear, I swear it's the final tier list. If Firaxis makes me look dumb again, Okay, that's fine. That means there's just more Civ content. <laughs> but for real, this is the final leader tier list of Civilization VI. Uh, I'm going to be explaining a few different things before getting to the actual rankings. So if you wanted to skip around to specific parts of the video, I'm going to leave the timestamps here so you can pause it and figure out where you want to go. Now, who am I? Uh, if you don't know who I am, I'm Bose. I play Civilization VI on D80 regularly, albeit I am now going into other content. But for the past three years, I've played Civ VI on D80 every day for like the past three years straight. Um, I have around four, uh, just under 4,000 hours into the game, so that's take that as you will. Like all my other tier lists on leaders, this is specifically for playing versus the AI on D80 difficulty, which is the hardest difficulty in the game. Um, can this apply to other difficulties? Can I apply it to multiplayer? I mean, yeah. It, like the general gist of it can, but some of the civs ranked here may be terrible in multiplayer, or they may be S tier, super good in multiplayer. Really good examples like Catherine. Catherine's great in multiplayer. Um, just take that as you will. Take my rankings with with a grain of salt when it comes to other things that aren't deity difficulty. Like as I said before, uh, I exclusively play on deity. Uh, sometimes harder with the additional mods and I've been playing deity on all of the Civ games that I've played over the vast like 15 ish years that I've been playing Civ so most of my knowledge is coming from that aspect uh, I'm going to be judging Civs in this tier list without the addition of game modes those were introduced in the new frontier pass so if you don't have the new frontier pass don't worry about it but just think about that because there are some civs who are just objectively better with game modes on. A really good example is Trajan of Rome. If you get Void Singers, you just get monuments for free. Or if you find a hero turn one, you can work that hero on turn one. So keep that in mind. I'm going to be thinking about these without game modes because, as stated before, some civs are objectively better. Now, with this in mind, uh, I do have a specific formula for ranking civs on a 100-point scale. Um, all credit goes to Peppermint Butler for creating this initial list. I think it was back in, like, I want to say, like, 2021 that he made this list. Uh, he is a mathematical PhD doctorate man, um, so I, I wouldn't have been. I, I, it's not a difficult, like, the formulas aren't super difficult, but I am a dumb himbo who just plays Civ, so. <laughs> These are the six sections for ranking. Uh, the first one is early game strength. How powerful are the Civ's abilities in the early game? Can they get you off to a good start? Early boost, start the snowball. Uh, late game strength. How powerful can the Civ be when they are fully online in the late game? So how well do their abilities scale for like good districts, stats, etc.? Uh, versatility, are the Civ's abilities useful under multiple conditions? Or do they put the Civ on rails where they can only just kind of do one thing, if that makes sense? Dependencies, how dependent is the Civ on external forces, map, spawn, religion, pantheon? Synergy, how well do all of the Civ's abilities work well together? And finally, strength of focus this is the sixth section for ranking. How strong is the Civ at their presumed focus? Now, that sounds a little vague, but a really good example of this is Basil of Byzantium. All of his kit, all of everything that you want to do, what you want to do with him is super strong, right? Based off of his kit, you want to get a religion, you want to go domination, and you want to be spreading your religion while killing units and taking cities because you get extra damage, you spread your religion, and you take everything basically for free, and it's all built around his unique unit, like the timing. So that's kind of his strength of focus, right, is, is you want to go religious dom, so that's where the strength of focus comes in from. Now, I rank each section between 1 and 10, 1 being terrible hot garbage and 10 being perfect, and each of these sections are weighted a little differently for a total of 10. You can find the weighting right here. Now, I haven't changed this from Peppermint Butler's initial back end of weighting because we both value the same things when it comes to Civ. Uh, PB and I are, are very similar in that aspect. Um, we both think the early game is the important part of a Civ's kit as well as being able to use that early game to snowball with their entire focus of what they want to do. Now, that formula comes down to this. Uh, the formula is the total equals um, the uh, weighted formula times early game strength, weighted formula two times late game strength, weighted formula three times versatility, weighted formula four times dependencies, weighted formula five times synergy, weighted formula six times 
strength of focus, add them all together, you get your score out of 100. Um, so that is how that formula works. However, some things have changed. Uh, the formula itself doesn't necessarily have to change. We have to change some things that evaluate the formula and how much value you put into those points, unfortunately. Over the last year, Firaxis released the leader pass to Civilization VI. That included some civs like Yongle, Ludwig, and Theodora. Now, because of this introduction of some admittedly broken civs, this added what is all too well known as power creep to Civilization VI. If you are unaware of what power creep is, it's most famously known in like card games like Magic the Gathering. It also, I mean, it's in a lot of other games too, you know, League of Legends, Dota, so on and so forth, fighting games. What it means is that it takes, power creep happens when new content is introduced to the game and it's so good that it makes previous, makes older content underpowered and sometimes even obsolete. A really good example in Civ, without spoiling too much of my tier list, is the Congo. Uh, with the release of Nzinga Mabande, it, it didn't like 100%, but it kind of made Venva like obsolete. Like you could still play old Congo if you want to do some weird strategies, but the kit and the Zynga is basically what everyone wanted from old Congo in the first place. So with uh, new Congo released, makes them very good. Old Congo, they weren't the great greatest before. Now they're even worse. So that's that's what power creep is. And the fact that a bunch of power creep is into this, a bunch of civs that were, were introduced in this game that make a lot of civs rankings like wildly fluctuate means there's a lot of unfortunate power creep added to civilization six now taking that knowledge of the weighting and the scoring that i had mentioned previously we can kind of change we kind of have to change how each tier is broken down into so previously each tier was based off of a point system well it still is based off of a point system but for example with S tier, out of the 100, 100 score, you previously had to get a 96.9 score or above to become S tier. I bumped that up to a whole point of 97.9 or above to be S tier because I, S tier for me means that it is S tier no matter what. No matter what situation you are in, you're always going to have a good game regardless of the type of game you want to play, regardless of what's happening. It's always going to be good. So those are like S, S, S tier. They have to be up there. And I think... If I kept it with the old weighting system, there was like seven sieves who were S tier, which is just objectively, you look at it and you look at those sieves, you're like, that's not, that's not real. So S tier was changed to 97.9. A tier was previously 89.9 or above. I've bumped that up to two. So it's 91.9. Same thing with B tier. Uh, all of these below, I bumped up two points. So B tier 79.9 is now 81.9. C was 69, nice, 0.9 up to 71.9, and D tier, I bumped that up from 59 to 61.9, and obviously F tier is 0 to 61.9. So bumping up everything two points in the lower tiers, and then obviously S tier makes it up one point, makes it a I feel like it makes it a little bit more fair when it's going over like the rankings on how I weight the sieves. Um, otherwise, if you will look at it before, otherwise like a third of the sieves are A tier. Like it's, it's, it's just looking at it by like a just pure numerical number, they're just A tier. So um, with this in mind, please remember this while commenting because there's going to be a lot of sieves that are dropped down to like a whole tier or sieves that are like, how is XYZ civ in B tier? They're so good. They should be at least an A tier, if not borderline S, like in your previous drinking. And that's what, that's what happens when power creep is introduced. You are correct. There are a lot of really good sieves now. And when trying to rank them objectively, it's very hard because you go, okay, well, all of these are good. But unfortunately, when power creep is introduced, some sieves are just better than others. So uh, I'll, I'll be very honest, the bell curve from the previous skews a little bit higher than I'd like to like it to, but that's as, that's as fair as I can make it. With that all in mind, before we jump into the actual rankings, here is my previous tier list adjusted with the 2022 mid tier list rankings. Now you can pause here and look at them and then post. Let me know in the comments below what you think or any of the changes are going to be made as well as the leader pass changes. So pause it, comment, and are you ready? Let's go. Feature boast here. This is, as you could tell, around four hours long. Yes, my previous tier list was two hours long. 
deal deal with it deal with it no but really the reason i made this so long is because i wanted to go in depth on each leader and explain my reasonings on why this is a tier s tier f tier whatever uh especially comparing it to my previous rankings as well as just giving just a little bit more explanation than just saying oh yeah this is f tier because i think they're good so i went super in depth with this with this one there are also like 20 more leaders so it just took a lot longer overall uh but yeah, I just wanted to give that a heads up. Anyways, let's go. America. <laughs> Starting off, America, Bull Moose Teddy. We're going to be going from A to Z through civs, not through leaders, but through civs. Starting off with United States of America, America. We've got Teddy Roosevelt, Bull Moose Teddy. And uh, this boy, my, my, my favorite bud, Bull Moose, uh, he is, he's in B tier. Um, I, I think he is just one of those sieves that I, I didn't change him from the previous to this one. It's still B tier. He is a very good sieve. I really love, like, I'm very biased towards Teddy, uh, Bull Moose Teddy. Don't get me wrong, but there's just, with the, like I said, with the introduction of the new sieves, it's, he doesn't really drop down a little bit. He drops down, he drops, that drops down numerically, but he still is in B tier. Uh, with, with Teddy Roosevelt, he, the problem with him is that he is a little too reliant on things around him for him to be, be very good, right? He has to have really good appeal. Uh, he has to be either next to woods or a mountain for him to get either culture or science. So with Bull Moose Teddy, he does have a lot of dependencies, right? If you are, if you're not in a very high appeal situation, you basically are a vanilla sieve until you get to the point where you can build woods, um. However, if you do end up in a situation where you have a lot of appeal, you have, you know, you're, you're settled next to uh, woods and a mountain, you can literally get like four, six, eight extra culture and science per turn from turn like two, three, four, you know, once you hit pop two, there's an extra four science for you or four culture. So the snowball that is, is real with, uh, with Theodore Roosevelt bull moose. But if you don't have that, that becomes a real problem. Uh, so I still have Mr. Theodore in B tier. Uh, I feel like that's pretty fair. It, he is a very good sieve if you can get around to getting him going. But moving to our next Ted, uh, Rough Rider. Rough Rider is actually one of the sieves, well, one of the leaders, that I moved up a tier um, this, uh, this ranking compared to last year. Oh, never mind. I lied. I'm sorry. I'm looking at my spreadsheet. That is a lie. <laughs> He is still in C tier. However, I will say he is in a very high C tier. He is borderline B tier. Um, and that's mostly because of the way that I play has kind of changed a little bit. Uh, I do really appreciate his ability to utilize um, envoys and uh, being able to soothe everyone, being able to soothe every single Civ. Uh, but I still think that with the rest of his kit, it doesn't really work as well as I would like it to. Um, I think a better there's a, there is a sieve that I'll talk about later that I think does a little bit better than he does and that's because their kit is tied into religion as well. Um, so obviously the caveat is that you have to get a religion. However, with Rough Rider Teddy, there still is a possibility of getting a very strong start if you lean super hard into what his kit wants to do. Um, the the downfall for him is that for me when it comes to ranking and the strength of focus like in the synergy as aspect of it there are parts of his kit that don't really like some things just don't mesh well together and a really good example of why uh bull moose for example is a little bit higher than rough rider is because bull moose you know what you want to do you want to go culture you want to get a lot of culture very high w with his abilities of getting uh, as appeal based abilities, you want to build a lot of national parks and you want to build theater squares that have film studios in them that increase your tourism. So you just keep building tourism up, up and up and up and up. Um, and he has to have a unique unit. So he does, but we don't really, for him, that part of the kit doesn't really affect it. It's just kind of like, okay, you have a unique unit. Whereas rough rider, half of him wants to go domination and get extra combat strength. Whereas half of him wants to sue every single city state. And so it, it, it kind of depends on what you want to lean towards. I think even though they can be good, I still think Mustangs are not the best unit because once you get Mustangs, you literally have advanced flight right afterwards and you might as well just upgrade them <laughs> at that point. So I feel like they're 
they they hit a wall really fast um if you can rush them great but i feel like the wall you hit that wall super fast so so i don't know i still think that he is c tier i think he's like a high c tier he's borderline b but this is a really good example is where if i didn't have the power creep wasn't introduced i probably would have put him in b tier so there you have it there's rough rider the third american babraham lincoln <laughs> um Abe is a very good Civ. Uh, he has, you, you know exactly what you want to do. You want to get a lot of production. You want to wait till the mid to late game, most, mostly around the industrial era. Once industrial era comes, you want to pump out units as fast as possible because you'll be able to, because you can just, you, you just get free units over and over and over again, and you just completely stomp your opponent. So I have Abe up in B tier. Um, he does have some very high strength of focus and synergy like his whole kit comes together in being very productive being able to utilize getting free units and being able to just all of a sudden having a, an overwhelming army advantage in one specific part of the game and then continuing for the rest of the game however his early game is uh, it's whatever um his early game is okay uh he doesn't really have that much versatility like you can go religion with him but for you really want to go industrial zones as fast as possible. This is one of the few civs that you want to get industrial zones as fast as possible on top of having a lot of science. And so trying to go the religious route with him where he doesn't have any abilities that really mesh well with religion kind of makes it pretty one-sided or short-sided in what you want to do. That thing that you want to do is very good, but there isn't really any flexibility outside of that. So uh, Abe is good at mid to late game Dom, but other than that, it's kind of mediocre. So that's where I have him in B tier because it's just good. Arabia. I feel like Salah Adin of Arabia, specifically a vanilla Salah Adin. I think Arabia is one of those sieves that is like a decent sieve. Uh, but I also feel like <laughs> a lot of people are very polarized on, on Arabia. They either think they're very good or think they're trash. Um, I'm leaning more towards the not great aspect of arabia i think they're fine they the fact that you can get a free great profit i'm putting them in c tier by the way the fact that you can get a great profit for free is is pretty neat uh you can kind of just not worry about that worry about going getting a religion immediately you can just put down you can go campus first if you wanted to and then supplement it with with holy sites later on uh but with the fact that how good monumentality is you kind of want to go holy sites first anyway, so you can utilize the extra faith, so you can buy settlers and stuff like that. Uh, the problem that I have with Saladin is that there are just civs that do it better. Yes, you have the uh, you have the synergy between the madrasa and getting science and faith at the same time, uh, but I find that, like like I said, there's just civs that do it better than Saladin. Um, Peter, I mean Peter's the and all be all <laughs> but peter is like a really good example right like i just like that he can just do what arabia does better and faster um, and i think that's the problem is that a lot of these sieves that like seem good on paper other sieves will just do it faster which means that they can get to the end game of where you want to be faster than arabia does and there's another sieve uh, a good example is kind of germany and we'll get to that later i still think germany is good but well uh, don't flame me yet just wait wait till later <laughs> and i think arabia falls into that category um the getting the getting the last profit no matter what is pretty cool like you can like i said you can kind of just delay doing religious stuff whereas in deity without game modes you kind of have to rush you maybe even chop out get a religion but with him you can just put down your holy site and then do anything else and then you get a religion when you want but the problem with that for me especially if you're getting the last religion is on deity you're not really getting the beliefs that you want you might be able to get work ethic out of anything but you miss out on feed the world you miss out on uh on uh choral music um sometimes you even miss out i i i this is gonna be a hot take i think zen meditation is a fantastic um is a fantastic belief that is super underutilized um so i guess you can get world uh you can get work ethic but a lot of the times especially with arabian starts you're not gonna have ways to super utilize work ethic you're gonna have like one adjacency holy sites so you're really maximizing your plus two production you know um 
it, so I, I find that because it's a super late religion and you you want to just delay it, it doesn't end up being cost efficient, I guess is what I'm trying to say. All in all, I think Arabia is fine. I think they're a C tier. I think they're like a middle middle of pack, middle of the road sieve. Uh, there's nothing great about them. At least for Salah Adin. <laughs> but for Sultan Salah Adin, boy, oh boy. Man, this guy stinks! I, man, I was so excited for Sultan Salah Adin, And I just feel like he is, I don't know, man, like... He has so much potential. Now, in multiplayer, in multiplayer, I will say he has a possibility of being a very, very good Civ in multiplayer. You get flanking bonus and support bonus to all of your combat and religious units, so you can get super fast flanking uh, and support bonuses from turn one. Um, you still get the, the fact that you get a... Sorry, my Adobe Creative Cloud was updating. <laughs> You still get the great profit, so you can kind of go crusade. But that's another thing: is that in multiplayer, if you're picking Sultan Saladin, people already know what you're gonna do. You're like, oh, you want to get crusade and use your flanking bonus against me? I'm gonna take that from you, or I'm gonna take Defender of the Faith, right? In Deity, it's this is a kind of another problem that is I'm gonna compare him to Byzantium, where yeah, your flanking bonus, your flanking and support bonus is kind of cool. Uh, but it does like I don't know. It just doesn't work as well as you want it to. It doesn't work as well as you think it's gonna work. Um, there, it's just I, like wh why play Sultan Salah Adin when you could just play Byzantium instead, right? It it's and I I feel like that's like uh people are gonna be like, well, that's a cop out to say that, and I'm like, that's kind of the whole point that I'm trying to make with this tier list is that. There are so many sieves that are going to be good, but then you go, why should I? Why am I going to play this sieve when I can play this sieve instead? Um, and we're going to get a multiple examples of this in this tier list, so don't, don't, don't fret. But that's I. I just think Sultan Saladin is garbage. I was super hyped uh, when he when he was first introduced. I was like, oh my gosh, this is going to be a super fun religious domination sieve. And in, in in it's another sieve on paper. It seems really good, but then you play it and you're like, this is. It's fine. It's whatever. It's not F tier, but it's just it it ends up not working as well as you thought it would. So, <sighs> sorry, Sultan. John Curtin here. That was <sighs> sorry. <laughs> John Curtin of Australia. Yeah. Australia. How do my words good? This is our first A tier. Uh. John Curtin was always a borderline S tier Civ, even in my previous rankings. I had definitely gotten to a lot of conversations with uh, other Civ creators, as well as just like on my on my stream and stuff like that. Of is Australia a C tier? Or, I mean, sorry, an S tier Civ? They're they're at least before the leader pass, they were borderline S tier Civ. They're very very good. You have high production. You have really good early game. You have the possibility of getting like a plus six campus based off of appeal. Um, you have like you have all of these things. Their unique unit is very good. Their unique building or uh, improvement is very good. All of these things work really, really well together. That and they also have the extra production as well. So you have all of these things working really well together that create this very high productive science based civilization. Um, so we, there was always a a question of oh are they are they an s tier civ is there a possibility of them being s tier and i think there was before but with the leader press introduction i think they are just a solid a tier civ john Curtin is a very 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 good civ like don't get me wrong i think i think he is fantastic um i really enjoy playing with with him i i i played him in the last uh uh not the last last dude why can i know how do my words good um, Civ give, but the one before that, and it's uh, a very good. I was doing very well. Unfortunately, we had some desync issues, um, but that game, the 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 previous Civ give was gonna be uh, me and uh, uh, me and TGM and Potato versus the world uh, versus versus PB and Van Bradley, and it was gonna be it was gonna be a really fun fight. So, because uh, I was I was. John Curtin and PB was Dido. 
And so, and we both were playing, we were playing on a, a seven seas map. And so we had a lot of, we had a lot of sea between us, but we also both had a lot of land. And so I think PB would have won, but it was going to be very close because I was doing that thing where I was just getting a lot of campuses and a lot of production up. So it was, a, it was going to be a fun game. Sorry. Anyways. Well, I'll play if you don't know what the Civ Give is, by the way, it's a charity event that the Civ Show puts on every year uh, at around Christmas time, and we raise money for children's hospitals. Uh, mine was for the Children's Hospital of Los Angeles. And uh, usually Firaxis devs come in, and the last couple times we did, they had uh, Kevin come in, do the hot sauce challenge. I know Carl was there before. Uh, we've had some Firaxis devs come in and hang out on stream while we're playing the... Uh, it's a multiplayer free-for-all charity event. So uh, that's going to be happening this year again. We haven't put any de any details, but... The, the Civ Give will be happening again this year. Uh, anyways, I digress. Back to Australia. Very good Civ. High A tier Civ. I think they are just... I think they're a really sh good shining example of what is a good Civ that's going to be reliable every single game, um, but not, like, broken, not perfect, like some of the Civs later. And I think John Curtin's one of those. Monty! So this is one of those civs that i was playing recently and this is why the the tier list got delayed a couple times because there are some civs on this list that i ranked like way higher than i did on my previous tier lists um and this is this is one of them uh montezuma is a really good civ he's not s tier or anything but i think he belongs solidly into the high b tier uh almost a tier and the fact that his early game is can be incredibly substantial if you use his kit in the way that you want him to. So, uh, versus DD AI, you generally want to be close to other neighbors. You want to be able to use your Eagle Warriors to declare war, s kill their units, and get builders for free from them, and then use those builders to build your districts in like four turns. Um, if you can get that going, then you basically have an incredible early game that allows you to just, that allows you to snowball, uh, for the rest of the for, for the rest of the game is what I'm trying to say. Now, if you don't get that, then it's kind of then it's kind of a little bit more difficult, and you just become like a vanilla sieve. Now, he does have some really good abilities in his uh, I forget the name of it. It's the one that gives him extra amenities to cities. It basically acts like a mini coliseum if you have an improved luxury resource, which is why if you're playing versus uh, the Aztec, they're always like, "You have what I don't," because he just wants. He just wants the uh, the amenities. <laughs> Give him the amenities. And that's kind of one of the other things that I find a little weird about Montezuma. I do think he's a very good Civ. Uh, as I mentioned before, if you get him going in the way that you want, you do early game domination, and then you kind of focus into whatever else. I think that he's very good uh, at doing that. Um, I think he's best at doing science out of that. But because his only... He doesn't have anything in his kit that leans towards science except for the amenities. So that's why I kind of rank him down into B tier. I think he's a very good Civ. I still think, you know, he's a he's a good Civ in that, like, B tier is that good, not great Civ. And that's where I find Montezuma, where if you don't have a neighbor nearby, or if you do and you can't really kill his units with Eagle Warriors really fast and steal builders, then you kind of fall behind really far, and it's just a struggle for the rest of the game. Uh, it also doesn't help that his unique building uh is a, an arena replacement <laughs> which like i love arenas i get i try to get entertainment complexes at least one in my in every single game so i can have coliseum for amenities unless it's a dom game that i don't care but the fact that that's like you know at a un unique unit is an arena you're kind of like uh, it, it it feels weird you you see his early kit and then you see his late game kit and you're like i get what you're trying to do here sometimes it doesn't work sometimes it does so there you go monty B tier. Going from Monty to Hammurabi. This is going to piss some people off. He's in D. No, I'm just joking. He I'm just joking. <laughs> Hammurabi, if you watched my 2022 tier list update, I put Hammurabi into S tier as a like, all right, he's S tier. I get it. He's really, really good. Um, this is going to make some people mad. I'm dropping him back down to A tier. This is a A tier where he's like right here. And this is another example of what power creep can do to 
a game. Hammurabi is a very good sim. He is very, very, very good. There's only one problem with Hammurabi, and is that he is too dependent on some things in order to catapult yourself into the game. When I talk about S tier, S tier is a sieve that it doesn't matter if you start on a desert. It doesn't matter if you start on these th like on a plains map with no extra bonuses. This sieve is going to be incredible no matter what. You're going to be able to do what you want to do, obviously to some limitations, right? If you start, if you spawn on tundra and all you have is tundra around you and you're not Canada, there's you, you get what I'm trying to say. Hammurabi has almost all of that, except if you can't get some of your boosts, then you're gonna have a bad time. If you can't boost through stone, if you can't boost, if you can't boost through some things, you're not gonna have a fun time playing Hammurabi. That is his only limitation. That is his only limitation. Uh, everything else about Hammurabi is just, I always forget, I have to look it up. I always forget the name of his unique building. Um, what, what is it called? Why can't I think of the name of his? Palgum. Palgums are top two buildings in the entire game. The Palgum is incredible. If you don't know what the Palgum does, it's a, uh, it replaces the water mill. Um, but it gives you plus two production, plus one housing, and pl plus one, plus one housing, full housing, and plus one food to all tiles adjacent to a source of fresh water. So you get these, uh, two production, one, uh, you, you get a, you get a grass hill, which is two food, one production. And now these tiles turn into insane, like three food, one production. And you build a mine on it. You get the three, three, two tiles. If you have a forest, you turn them into lumber mills. You get these like four, four tiles like palgums are an incredible building that is super early uh the sabum kibitum is an extra melee unit that basically is the same price as a scout i think it's maybe costs one extra turn to build it in a scout has more combat strength than a scout does more extra combat strength than anti-cav which means you can defend yourself from horse rushes early on and it has extra movement in sight um very very good uh, unit. Obviously, the main thing about Babylon is that if you get a Eureka, you unlock the tech instantly. And that's where the only thing about Babylon falls a little short is that if you don't get your boosts, you're gonna have a bad time playing Hammurabi. That's a big if. Eight out of ten times, you're probably gonna get those boosts. And let's be real, if you're playing on Deity, you're probably gonna reroll until you get a good start. But if you take out that like think about start biases and stuff like that and think about everything like you know just taking what your start is at face value Hammurabi is going to be nearly s tier because you're probably not going to get the perfect start with him that you can boost everything with now when you watch my like speed runs with Hammurabi I cannot tell you how much time even with running BBS which BBS is better balanced starts it's a mod that I play with exclusively it's like the only gameplay mod that I play with exclusively because it basically makes everyone have a decent start. If you're playing, or at least if they have a start bias, they start on their start bias. Uh, that doesn't include just you. That includes the AI as well. So it makes the AI intrinsically better. It what I the reason main reason why I play with BBS is because it eliminates the rerolls that you see on stream so much. If you watch a Civ player play uh, on stream, they want to get a decent start, not a bad start. You sit there and there's re-rolling and re-rolling and re-rolling and re-rolling. And that that takes out the re-rolling part. If you're going to re-roll, it's going to be like one or two times. Um, so even with BBS, even without BBS, there still is a possibility that you don't get your boosts. Long story short, incredible Civ, almost there, not quite a tier. <laughs> don't, don't flame me into byzantium this one this one might be a little controversial um i like byzantium as a sieve i do like theodora as a leader i do not think she is s tier i think she is a good a tier sieve one of the main reasons is because of her once again like with a lot of sieves who i feel like once you get to b tier and up you're going to find that a lot of people, a lot of Civ's limitations are their dependencies and how dependent they are for what their kit wants to do and how that just affects the whole thing, which, you know, if they're dependent on stuff, that means their early game gets ruined, which means the snowball gets ruined. Well, maybe ruined is a harsh word, but it gets delayed. 
I find Theodore to be one of those sieves. I, I constantly kept seeing things like Theodora is S tier. You can get like plus 16 production and culture on her from one holy site. And yeah, that's a possibility. You can also get a plus one production culture faith holy site as well, which that doesn't do anything for you. Uh, it is one of those things. And I think that's another thing too, is I kept, whenever I'd see Theodora being played in like a let's play or being played on stream, it'd be like, look at this Theodora start. It's incredible. It's like no, no crap. It's not like you have a plus eight holy site on your first holy site. Any sieve is going to be incredible there, right? Or you spawned right next to a wonder. Now you have a plus eight holy site. Like obviously you're going to have an incredible start with her. Um, and so I've been finding that that maybe is a little disingenuous and maybe misleading and not disingenuous. It sounds like they're trying to be like evil about it. I'm finding that that makes it seem like she's a lot better than she is. Uh, and don't get me wrong, when you get those good starts, she's fucking incredible. And that's why I have her in A tier. Because, like I said, pl if you go work ethic with her, plus you get a plus eight holy sight, that's plus, and then you get put in uh, scripture, the policy card scripture, which allows you to get, which doubles your holy sight adjacency. That means you get a plus 16 culture, production, and faith holy sight in one city, and you can apply that to all of your cities. So. I, I definitely think she is incredible for uh, for doing that, at least. Now, the only thing with her that I... Uh, and this is kind of where I get upset with the... Uh, the you can see me, you can hear me typing it up because I can't remember the names off the top of my head. This is where I get kind of annoyed with the alternate leaders. She's not an alternate leader. She's a, she's a second leader for a... Well, I guess you'd call her an alternate leader um, for Byzantium is that they don't get the leader unique unit. And generally the leader unique unit is more powerful than the Civ unique unit. Now, what do I mean by that? Byzantium has two unique units, right? You got the Dromon and you get the, um, this is why I Google it and you'd think that I'd have it right here. And you get the Tagma. Tagma D, sorry. Uh, outright, the Tagma is is better um and i think the reason why i dislike like the the unique unit the dromon dromons are very good like dromons are, it's like it's a good unit um but when it comes to the kit tag you get free tagmas when you build the hippodrome you don't get that tagma ability with theodora additionally with theodora you don't get the extra um full damage with heavy and light cav units uh and you don't gain the tagma unit with divine right right so you get you get like some of the things from byzantium's kit but those things don't synergize and work very well with like her her ta the taxis ability right the taxis ability is a standalone ability now with byzantium whereas with basil it works and integrates well with the tagma uh as well as his unique heavy uh, full damage ability so there are some like things that i dis that that is introduced when it comes to these alternate leaders that just kind of make things a little muddled um because you look at it and you're like well this kind of stinks right you don't get the like what's the point of playing this if you don't get this part of their kit um and so some of that i, I dislike taking that but I, I don't know sometimes i go in these segues and i don't know what i'm saying <laughs> i mean i know what i'm saying but i'm like where am i going with this uh all in all, Theodora is a still a very strong sieve. Um, she has really early, good early game strength. I find that most sieves who are faith based tend to have really good early game, early game strength, and I think Theodora does it really well. She does have some limitations, however. But Basil, on the other hand, is still an incredible sieve. He's also a tier as well. Uh, both Byzantium sieves are very good. Um, the re I I find Basil to be a little bit higher. He might be just under S tier. And the reason being is that Taxus, as well as, I don't know how to pronounce his leader bonus. I'm not going to attempt it. Uh, if someone can tell me how to pronounce it, that'd be fantastic. But the, the, all of those abilities that work together work like so well together. I mentioned it in explaining how the tier list works, but his strength of focus and his synergy and what his kit wants to do is just like, that's, 10 out of 10, you, when you see a Civ and you read their abilities, you know what they want to do. That's exactly, that's, that's Byzantium, that's Basil, the second of Byzantium. You want to get a religion. 
you want to go crusade. You want to get, uh, you want to get a lot of heavy calves, and you want a timing attack right when you get tagmas. You could do it before if you wanted to. But you want to build, get tagmas, get hippodrome, get these units for free, and just completely destroy. Especially, you know, the AI, but you can do it in multiplayer too. And because of that, you can branch off from there and do whatever the hell you want. Uh, some of the deity AI speed runs of winning like science victories are with Basil. Um, uh, I don't remember if it was Platypus or Somnax who got a. Uh, in, in Sir Duck's Lancelot's community, they were doing these speed runs, these TSL Earth huge speed runs with like Basil, with Hammurabi, and then Somnax got, it was one of them, I, I apologize, I'm not sure which one it was, I, uh, I'd have to look it up. They got a turn like 97 science victory with Basil, because you can go to war so early with your religion and completely destroy cities with wall, like, you know, even if they have walls, it doesn't matter, you have tagmas, you can just completely destroy them, get tons of cities and go to space really fast, and then channel, uh, and you can use those abilities Combine it with uh, Warlord's Throne, where you get the extra production every five turns from, uh, and then you know, get taking a city and then pillaging. It just works so well together that it can be absolutely insane. Now, why don't I have him in S tier and an A tier? And it's kind of the same thing as with Theodora, as with Hammurabi. If you don't get a re now, it's very rare that you don't get a religion as Basil. But remember, we're talking about deity without game modes. If you don't get a religion, you have to you have to wait for a religion to re reach you before you get his full abilities of killing the other uh, civs, right? And so, sorry, my fan just turned on. So that is a very very small caveat, right? And that's why with Hammurabi, he's up here in super high A tier because if you don't get a religion, then you're kind of a vanilla vanilla faith based civ, which don't we really like faith based civs are great waiting until you someone spreads their religion to you or you just go and you know try and kill them uh and you have to wait you don't get as much strength um you can't spread your religion you don't get crusade which like synergizes super well with everything else so it's that one little little caveat and that brings them down to not into s tier don't yell at me don't do it brazil pedro yeah, you're B tier, you're B tier, bud. Uh, Pedro is another good example of some sieves that are good, but he has some limitations and power creep. Pedro is a fantastic sieve if you get a rainforest start and you can get what's the name of the pantheon? Sacred Path on deity. Sacred Path is as reliable as getting religious settlements. <laughs> I don't know why the AI loves Sacred Path. That is why I find Brazil so hard to play, at least for what I want to do, because genuinely you're gonna get a rainforest start and but Sacred Path is gonna be gone. So you can't even really lean into what you want to do with Brazil anyways. Now, he's still a really good sieve. The amount of great people you can generate with him, the amount of culture that you can get with him is top notch. But because of his shortcomings, and the fact that you really only want to do one thing and one thing only, and that's go culture, does kind of drop him down a little bit because his early game can be stifled. His early game can be either incredible or stifled. Um, and that kind of, if you obviously, if you average it out, it just makes it decent, which is like, I think B is like a perfect example of that. It's like decent. His dependencies are a little harsh uh, just because of the rainforest. So, you know, and it plays into his kit. I feel like B tier is pretty fair for Pedro. I know that there's some Pedro truthers out there who are going to be mad at me. Just I should just like put in big old text up here, power creep. Remember, power creep. <laughs> and if you maybe skipped ahead to Brazil and you didn't watch my intro stuff, watch it. Like, there's power creep. At least just watch the power creep part. Then you'll understand. B tier. Bonjour, mes amis. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, French Canadians. I apologize. Uh, <laughs> Canada. Wilfred. He's a good sieve. I have him in B tier. Um, 
the the thing with Wolfred is that oh yeah, he's good. All right, see ya. Goodbye, everybody. Sayonara. Um, no, Wolfred's a good Civ that is dependent on his start position. Now, you're gonna say the same thing with everybody. They're all based on their start position. Yes, I like I get that, but Wolfred's kit is literally built around being in tundra and having camps, stuff like that, and being able to get a builder early on. He's one of the few Civs that. I almost would rather rush a builder than get a scout because you could build farms on Tundra and you get like a plus four food tile immediately. There's like, he's like one of the few civs. I'd say maybe Hammurabi as well as uh, Vanilla China are probably some of the civs that I would suggest getting a builder early on. I generally don't. I still get a, a scout and maybe I go scout builder settler because of the snowball is so strong with them early game. Um, but that's, that that's kind of, the problem, or sorry, that's that's where I, I think about when it comes to uh, Wilfred. He is a little too dependent, though. Um, if you think uh, about Peter versus, the, I, f I feel bad for like measuring everyone against Peter, but you'll understand P why when I talk about Peter. If you think about Peter versus Wilfred, if you start on a non-Tundra start, Wilfred literally turns into a vanilla sieve with like basically no abilities, right? Um, whereas Peter. With with Peter, you still have a half cost holy site, um, and that's kind of that's that, that's kind of the the big like that's the that that's the issue there is that if you take him outside of Tundra, he kind of becomes a vanilla sieve. Ice hockey rinks don't do anything really. His uh, his base. What's the name of his ability? Always is it? I mean, I guess you get the four the four faces of peace, which is like you know can't declare surprise wars which is nice because you can be i mean you're probably gonna get announced anyways by the ai but you can be squished by the ai and not have to worry about surprise wars immediately you get 10 turns at least um uh but the other thing is that his ability to get farms on tundra tiles and tundra hills and all that stuff like and also the cheap, oh, I, always forget, I always forget about the cheap purchasing. The cheap purchasing is actually very nice. That type of stuff where the far, like farms and camps receive plus two food, mines and lumber mills receive plus two production. That is like it just becomes a moot point at that point, and you just turn into a vanilla sieve. Um, so that's why that that's kind of you can kind of sense the theme here, right? With these B tier sieves, is that if you get their kit going and you do their kit what their kit wants to do, and you get a good start, then they're like a good. They become an objectively good sieve. But if you don't, then they just turn into like a vanilla sieve and it's kind of middle of the road. And I feel like, especially C, like this, that's what this whole, I feel like that's a really good measurement of what a a decent sieve, but like not an overpowered sieve is, is if you can get their kit going, they're a good sieve. But if you can't, they're kind of vanilla. They're not terrible, but they're just kind of whatever. Um, that's rough Canada, man. I like playing Canada. Don't get me wrong. Uh, I think I think when I have a lot of fun playing Canada, but uh, B tier. That's all I gotta say. B tier. Kublai Khan China. Uh, what is there to say about Kublai Khan China? Not a not a whole lot. Uh, I think both Kublai Khans are a downgrade of their vanilla sieves, <laughs> their their count vanilla counterparts. Um, with Kublai Khan, you get the ec extra economic policy slot. Be careful, you can soft lock your game if you <laughs> No, I'm just kidding, you're fine. But uh I I also know that you gain like you what is it? You gain random Eureka yeah, random Eureka and inspirations upon establishing a trading post with another major civ civilization. Who cares? <laughs> I like I like the economic policy slot. That's nice, right? That's like basically getting something like uh a big ben. It's like a free big ben, for example the extra economic policy slot those are always nice to have early game because then you can run both like uh corvée and the plus one production card at the same time or you can run both the both the plus one production and the god king so you can get your pantheon while getting extra production at the same time well, that's not bad but i find that the the ec the trading post economic or sorry the trading post eureka and inspiration stuff is just so like it's it, it's uh, the, like the first time you establish a trading post. It's like it takes such a long time to establish a trading post that 
by the time you get those eurekas and inspirations it's just like it doesn't matter it really doesn't matter at all um and also playing kublai khan china uh you get the worst part you lose the best part about playing china in the first place and that's the first emperor ability being able to get an additional charge and spend builder charges um on wonders and the fact that you don't get that is like i i that's just i don't know that's just so it sucks like yeah sure you get the other you know 10 percent discount all that jazz but like that's not the point of playing china the point of playing china is to wonder spam uh so i have kublai khan down in the c tier like he has some good abilities but he's just uh i he he's just i don't know what he's he's a whatever civ um that like there's a lot of these multiple persona packs that they released like these multiple leader packs that civ released i like i love getting all this content especially the fact that the leader pass was free technically if you got if you had all the dlc right it's a free pass but a lot of these like leader pass stuffs some of them i was just like why why like i get that you're putting it in and it's like cool that there's more content but some of them were just like it felt kind of half baked. It felt like being like, okay, but why'd you why'd you make this? It's like it just takes the sieve, it gives them a niche ability that makes it worse, and that's kind of how I felt feel about Kublai Khan. So I think C tier. It's like it's almost like low C tier if I'm being honest. It's not great. And next we have our first F tier sieve, Wu Zutian. I'm not I, like please like I'm, I apologize if I'm like butchering some of these Chinese pronunciations. Uh, I, I want to know how to pronounce things. Like that's, that's my whole thing is I like, I want to learn how to pronounce things. So if I don't, if I'm not pronouncing something correctly, like, please let me know. Um, but she is, she was my most hyped Civ or hyped leader that I was excited about coming from the leader pass to the most disappointing one. And she is just, she, well, you can't, I'll, I'll keep her up here for now. She is F tier. She is not a good leader in Civ. Uh, you get a free spy from Defensive Tactics, but Defensive Tactics is such a weird Civic to put it at. You have to get Games and Rec, um, which is the... the that allows you to build the Coliseum uh, and the Entertainment Complex. It's such a weird path on the Civic tree that it, it feels like you'd rather go... you rather go south on the Civic tree because if you're playing China... Specifically, if you're playing Wuzu Tian, you want to get extra science and culture because you want to do domination and science. That's kind of like your bread and butter with her is dom science. Using spies to either uh, siphon, uh, to steal techs or steal eurekas or to gain diplo uh, visibility so you can get extra damage to do, to, to kill the AI. That just, like, none of that works together with her kit. First of all, spying in Civ sucks. I'm sorry. There's only two Civs that it matters with, Mongolia and France. Spying in Civ sucks. Uh, unless you're, like, going super heavy into siphoning funds with the Machiavellianism policy card. Spying is not a good use of your time in Civ. Uh, and the main reason is because even with Machiavellianism, which that card reduces all of your spy missions to 50% and allows them to work at one level higher, it takes too much time to the point where, especially in the late game, you're going to be flying through those techs or flying through those civics faster than you can steal the techs. And so the lead up time for Wu in order for her to use those spies and to gain some tech boosts to gain to steal some great works and stuff like that it just does not matter it's like yeah sure with her if you do that you get 50 percent of the science and culture that city produced that turn yeah you get nice little boosts and stuff like that but it's just like that it just it's not it's not good it's not good it doesn't work well. It's it's like a neat little idea. You're like, oh, that's cute. And it just does not work well, especially with the rest of her stuff. You expect it to be like, okay, I'm going to use her abilities to boost uh, with the China's abilities of like the 10% extra science and culture uh, whenever you get Eureka. And so you think it's like, oh, I'm going to get this snowball effect where I complete a spy mission. I gain the science and culture. I go through and I get an Eureka at the same time. 
um, or I complete a wonder at the same time. And it's like all of that just does not synergize well like you think it would. Um, and I think that is actually kind of my problem with a lot of the newer leaders and leader passes that aren't OP is that their ideas sound good on paper, but on practice, they do not work out well at all. Saladin sounds really good on paper and practice. It doesn't really work out at well, as well as Wu in China. And that is our first F tier sieve. It's just, it, she's not good. Um, even with China's base abilities of dynastic cycle um, and getting the crouch and tiger and stuff like that, it's just, she's just not a good sieve. And that also uh, brings me to another sieve who I had to change based off of my playing the sieve recently on my tier list and being like, this is a good sieve. And that is Chin Chir Huang, which is vanilla China leader, and that is in B tier. I had I had him in C tier for a very long time. He's a good Civ. He's a, he's a really good Civ, especially once you want to put his entire kit together. Uh, I think it's just Mandate of Heaven now is what it's called, right? Yeah, Mandate of Heaven. Your builders receive an additional builder charge. Uh, you can also use your builder charges to complete 15 flat product, fifteen percent flat production cost of the ancient and classical wonders. You also get canals with masonry super early on. I never really cared about the canal stuff. That's like that one's kind of like a, oh that's cute. Doesn't doesn't really doesn't really matter that much. Um, now the the main reason why this works so well together is because that is how if you haven't watched it yet, I have a building every single wonder with China uh, on deity video which you can find here. I'm also doing it again. I'm doing it again with no game modes, <clears throat> but. With him, you just spam builders at the beginning, and you can just constantly chain wonders over and over and over again. And this is one of the main things about China is that completing a wonder grants a Eureka and an inspiration from that wonder's era. So if you build a classical era wonder, you get a classical era Eureka and inspiration. Those Eurekas and inspirations also gain give you an extra 10% of the science and culture costs for researching those. So you gain extra science and culture whenever you build a wonder. You have abilities that allow you to build wonders uh, a lot faster, which are the builders getting an extra charge, which means you can complete up to 60% of a builder or of a wonder with just one builder. And by the time you build a second builder, you put in 60% and then you complete the rest of the 40% with that second builder. And so you can just kind of chain these wonders with your builders. Um, there's also a little trick too, which a lot of people don't know that you can do. And this is why I also think he's very good is you can work on a builder while building a wonder at the same time. Uh, and what you do with that is because you're adding flat production to the wonder itself, you're not adding it to the production queue. So you, what you do is you have a builder in the production queue at one uh, at the top and you have your wonder in the second part. You swap your wonder up to number one in the production queue. You click the button that adds production to the wonder with the builder that you already have. It adds that 15% flat production. And then you can swap it back to your builder and work the builder in that turn over turn. And then you'll then on the next turn, you'll notice, okay, I have one turn worked on a builder. You swap it, swap it back to the wonder again, and you still have that extra 15% production that you just added to that wonder because his ability as I, I've said it like multiple times now, because his ability gives flat production cost to the wonder itself and not the production queue. So you can build things while you're building wonders at the same time. You can even build multiple wonders at the same time while you're doing that. Um, uh, there's There'll be a clip playing while I'm explaining this all, showing you exactly what I mean, because it is very, very strong. So all in all, Mandate of Heaven, a good Civ. I believe I had them in C tier last time. I think he's a good Civ, and I, I'm putting him up into B tier now. Oh, the Whiplash is real. <laughs> Unifier China. Oh, man. It was like, this was a cute game. No subtle, no subtle domination, if you haven't watched it. The, the video is up here. No subtle domination with, uh, with Unifier China. Oh, boy. This is another hot garbage Civ. Our second f tier sieve like i said the whiplash is real boy does this sieve stink <laughs> all melee units get the ability to convert barbarians into your army okay cool 
it i i hate this ability so much man like it's cool for maybe early game where you're getting raided by barbs and you can convert those into into your own warriors but then what what i end up finding happening unless i'm doing like a very cheeky build is that i end up needing those warriors to defend myself from barbarians because you're not gonna be able to gain every single barb in like one perfect charge of that warrior and then you f you end up not really having the massive army that you think you're gonna have because you're just using those extra warriors to kill a barbarian camp and not being able to like charge after your your enemy right after that it's just oh man it's just i don't know i think th this goes back to what i talked about earlier with kublai khan and and Wu is that these leader pass leaders feel like they were just like this sounds like a cool ability. Let's just create a perso uh, an alternate leader who does it and see what happens. And that's like, all right, that sounds cool, but it's really not that good. <laughs> that's why I have Unifier down in, in F tier. It's just, it's, it's not, it's not, he's not good. He's not good. Yongle. Yongle. Yolo. <laughs> this is our first S tier Civ. Whoo! Yongle is so good. He actually might be. This one's tough. If he is like number one S tier, or if he's on the the same page as everyone else, Yongle is so damn good. I cannot emphasize how good Yongle is. Uh, another leader for China. I had no, I had no idea what they're gonna do for Yongle when it came to China. I was like, I, I didn't really know anything about Yongle. I did a little research on him, and I was like, well, I don't know how they're gonna implement uh, this leader into China as being a good civ. And whoo -hoo, boy, was I, I, I was not prepared for Lijia. It is such a good ability, Lijia is a project that you can work there are three of them there's a where it converts um two of them convert 50 percent of your production and one of them converts 100 percent so there's a food one a food lija a faith lija or a gold lija the food one excuse me converts 50 percent of your production into food the faith one converts 50 percent of your production into faith the gold one converts converts 100% of your production into gold. Um, and, uh, and then the, the biggest thing about this one is cities with 10 or more population gain plus two gold, plus one science and plus one culture for every population. You've seen me do one city challenges with him. You've seen me just go absolutely insane with him. Yongle is insanely good. Now you might be saying, well, that, you know, that that's the only part of his ability that makes him like crazy good. And the answer is yes. The reason being is because you can reliably get religious settlements every single time as Yongle. Even if you're on like a plains hill, you're going to be able to get plus two ish faith per turn from turn one of the game. And the way that the faith per turn Lijia works is that it carries over to the next turn. Whereas the food and the gold one do not. I don't know why that works. I think it might just be the way that like faith is accumulated in the game. So for example, let's say you're working a faith lija. You have 24 faith total. You're on the turn. It says plus three faith per turn. You know, if you, and you have lija in your production queue to be worked. If you take it out of your production queue and work on something else, you're still going to accumulate that plus three per, per plus three faith per turn, and you'll have 27 faith per turn on the next turn, even if you aren't working that project on the turn rollover. However, if you're working the food lija and you take it out of the production queue and it's uh, and you work on something else during the next turn rollover, that food does not carry over like the faith does. I don't know why it doesn't work like that. Um, the gold does not either. It's just the faith one. If I'm wrong, please tell me if I'm wrong. But from all the times of me testing it, that's that's how I've experienced it. And I've I put out. I don't think I actually made a video on it. I did it on stream once though, where with Yongle you can get religious settlements by like turn ten, reliably turn eleven or twelve every single time. If you go 
food Legia into into pop two, and then you go faith immediately afterwards because you're going to get pop two around turn three, and then you're going to be able to get enough faith per turn to get religious settlements by turn eleven at the earliest, ten eleven at the earliest, thirteen ish is was the average, which means you can get your pantheon on turn thirteen. Now you can get religious settlements if you want. If you don't, get whatever else. But this is a very important point when it comes to s tier sieves and it's something that i haven't talked about yet which i probably should have earlier is tempo tempo is a main thing is one of the main things in civilization 6 that allows you to complete the get like that's one of the main reasons why i can get like sub 200s like every single time i play the game is because i've learned how to really control the tempo of the game and by that, I mean being able to get an early game advantage, use that early game advantage to snowball into what I want to do, and then take that snowball and completely expand and like crush whatever I'm doing. For example, we'll say domination. Uh, I can, or actually, we'll just say we'll just say, say like culture games. I could take a really good like Yongle game, get religious settlements. That means I get my second city out before turn twenty. While I'm working, while I get religious settlements, I'm working on my third settler. My third settler pops out around turn 20-ish. I settle my second city, turn 19, sometimes turn 20. I settle my third city by turn 25, 26, 27. That means I have three cities working at turn 27. I can just, from then on, work food legia to get all of those cities to pop whatever I need to be. My capital city to, like, pop 10 by turn 35 my second and third cities to pop three, four, five at the same time. And then I can just do whatever the hell I want. I can get a religion. I can get a holy site during that time as well. Um, I can, I can just do whatever and get a ton of faith, get a ton of food, get my cities really high uh, population. And then what you do is just every time you settle a new city, just work the food legia immediately, get them to pop two, pop three, pop four within like three to four turns and now you have these, you have tons of cities. These cities have super high production. You're going to get all of them to pop tens. They're going to be getting extra gold, science, and culture for per population. Uh, on top of doing like faith and culture stuff at the same time, it's just, it is absolutely insanely broken. And I remember when this was released and I was like, I was reading the abilities. I was like, that sounds broken, but that's not as good as I think it is, right? And then when I first started playing them, I was like, I don't understand how they let this through the game. Like they, they must've just been like, fuck it we ball like we're gonna release this i don't care how good it is we're just gonna release it and be like have fun it's broken we don't care because that's how i feel about yongla uh it doesn't matter the start that you have you can get him his population up really high really fast if you need to you can just switch over and go straight into gold and get like hundreds of gold per turn from all of your cities running the gold ninja in like three turns and have like a thousand like he is so insane at what he does absolute s tier it's there's like no question if he's s tier or not like yongla live yongla reaction that's it that's the ranking pound maker of the Cree. hello sir i am a known pound maker stan i love the Cree. i love pound maker and i'm not gonna get too into depth with why but uh they're gonna be in b tier i think pound maker is a good sieve He's kind of along the same lines of all of these sieves here. He has good early game. He has decent late game. Uh, you can kind of do whatever you want with him. But the thing with that is that even though he's a jack of all trades, he doesn't really specialize in one perfect thing. He doesn't like really go hard. If anything, maybe science is where he excels at the most. But because of that, that kind of brings him down a little bit. He is a little too reliant on his starts. Poundmaker, uh, his... The reason why I like him so much is because of his early game stuff that you can do with him. That you research pottery, you get uh, a trade route immediately, and then your trade routes provide plus one food and gold in the destination city. I think it's per camp, yeah, per camp or pasture at that city. Um, additionally, you get un it's he it works kind of like how the I, I find it like a a, a, a predecessor to. The Shoshone in Civ 5, where the Shoshone could gain a lot of tiles really fast and expand really fast. It's kind of like what Poundmaker does with his uh, trade routes, where any tile that the trade route goes through within three tiles of the city, that becomes your territory in that city. And so you could use trade routes really early on to settle, 
maybe and then send the trade route into that direction to gain tiles that you normally would have to buy to. I find that really useful. Also is Okachita, I think that's pronounced that. His unique scout unit is incredible. <laughs> receives a plus receives an extra promotion when whenever you first get them. Uh, you also gain uh, I think it's like higher combat strength. I think it's twenty combat yeah, it's twenty combat strength. Which is huge. You can do like uh, you can do recon only domination with with Poundmaker. Um, also Mechawops. I love Mechawops. I am a slut for uh, early game good t uh, tile improvements and infrastructure. And a Mechawop placed between like two to three luxury resources, boner resources is going to give you like a three food, two production, one gold or two gold uh, tile early game which allows you to snowball really fast so if if you can combine and the fact that all, all almost all of his abilities are unlocked with pottery means that you can just go pottery first it's the first tech that you can research all of those combined means you can get a good early game going if you have luxury and bonus resources that you can place mechawops with um and if you have the abilities to expand and use your trade route abilities to to gain extra food um, really fast and make your cities grow really fast. Those are some of his constraints. Also, the fact that, like I said, he is good but not great at everything that he does kind of makes him like, okay, you're just a good Civ. So, Poundmaker B tier. If you haven't played him, I like just go play him. Go try to settle cities and get those cities to grow as fast as possible. Don't do do internal trade routes with each other and go science into democracy and lean super hard into democratic trade routes with uh, within your cities. And you, you'll find that his science potential is really really good um so have fun with them pound is a good sieve b tier <sighs> cleopatra she's all right i have her into c tier um and this is a really good example of power creep coming into play because we'll talk about our our waifu in a second original cleopatra is a good sieve it's a uh, a good sieve that allows you to get your cities to a lot of food and gold. Um, your international trade routes give you plus four gold uh, as well as plus two food from other sieves, I believe. Um, you also get extra alliance points from trading as well. Uh, another thing with her is that you also get extra production towards your districts and wonders if they're built next to a river. Uh, those floodplains also do not... Uh, um, prevent them or don't do don't give damage what's what i'm trying to say they are immune from flood damage from floodplains so that means you can get some really fast wonders some really fast production uh, really fast districts along rivers with floodplains and can go you can kind of do whatever you want with her you can you can go science with her which means you can get like the um you, you can go uh campuses next to like dams aqueducts and industrial zones along a floodplains river and not have to worry about them getting flooded or you can go culture. You can, you know, you get 15% production, which if you stack that with the, uh, you go, um, you stack that with the 10% extra production from your government, as well as the extra production you get from classical and ancient era wonders from your pantheon, allows you to get really fast wonders with her. And maybe you can get like great bath early game. So you can get those like super high uh, flood plane tiles. And then you can transition that into culture by getting sphinxes around them. You can kind of do a lot with her, but I'd say that she is very limited into having a power spike. If you don't have a good, like, river tiles to put floodplains on, um, or you don't have a good floodplain river tiles to put districts on and uh, wonders. Actually, never mind. It's not floodplains. It's just rivers. I don't know. I, I think floodplains might have been before Gathering Storm. Yeah, let's look it up here. Yeah, it's before Gathering Storm. Um, so she's kind of, she's, like, good. It, what she does, but she's not great. Um, there are other sieves who do it better than her. Uh, there are other sieves that uh, excel at things better than she does. Her her uh, Mariano Chariot Archers are good. Uh, that's a good unit. But the main reason why she is in C tier is because Ptolemaic Cleopatra is just her but better. Sorry, Cleo. Our waifu into B tier. Ptolemaic Cleopatra is literally exactly what I've wanted out of Egypt for like such a long time. I love appeal based civs. That's why I love Teddy so much. Even though he's in B tier, he's one of my favorite civs to play. Ptolemaic Cleopatra is just so good. Like 
the arrival of Hoppy gives you plus one food and culture for resources on floodplains next to her in her cities and floodplains grant plus one appeal to instead of the negative one appeal so you can get her cities if you spawn next to a floodplain and you have like a uh, rice tile or a wheat a wheat tile in your city that's on a floodplain you're gonna have a three food like two three food and uh culture um uh three food one culture tile on your on your in your city that you can work from turn one like it's insane I, I think i posted a screenshot where i had like a three food one production one culture wheat tile that was uh that was that i was able to work turn one from her like she is so good at gaining a lot of culture and a lot of food really fast early game and then the fact that you want floodplains give her appeal and uh the fact that you can synergize that with national parks and you can build national parks on floodplains is sorry what i'm trying to get go here with you want to utilize her sphinx which sphinx give plus two appeal to adjacent tiles floodplains also give appeal so if you just build a sphinx next to a floodplain you can go uh national parks with her you can go preserves with her on the fact that you also get the extra production towards districts and wonders uh next to river you can do these really fast crazy preserve national park theater square shenanigans with sphinxes and get a really really fast culture victory with cleopatra um i i think that the main reason why i like her so much over base cleo is the early game abilities of growing your cities really fast you'll kind of find that as a theme is that a lot of civs are that are really good are able to a grow their cities very fast or they can use their cities to gain a very fast early game advantage that allows them to build off of that and snowball and Ptolemaic Cleopatra does that a little bit better than vanilla just because you can get extra food and culture from the beginning of the game another thing culture for me is king that used to be the thing in Civ 5 production is king culture for me is king in Civilization 6 yeah you want like high productive cities but culture allows you to unlock policy cards, which allows you to utilize production better, utilize science better, utilize faith better, utilize buildings, builders, settler, everything better, right? Like colonization allows you to build settlers 50% faster. Ilkum allows you to build builders 30% faster. Um, uh, scripture, if you have, if you use the policy card scripture and you have a high adjacency holy site, it'll, it doubles your holy site uh, adjacency because of the policy card so if you have a lot of culture you can get to these policy cards faster which means you can utilize them earlier which means you can use your production faster and earlier to your benefit and so being able to get early game culture with cleopatra means that she is better intrinsically than vanilla cleopatra because you can access that culture early on now once again just like the rest of these sieves she is very dependent on being next to floodplains and being next to resources next to floodplains if you're talking about start bias, she does have one of the highest start biases in all of Civ. Uh, there is a list of start biases, and she is on them. There are some Civs that literally don't have a start bias. So the fact that she does have a start bias means that you're probably going to start next to a floodplain and or resources. Uh, so Ptolemaic Cleopatra, it's probably a little bit of my bias showing, but B tier. <laughs> it's time for uh, number three Egypt, Ramses II. Uh, he's just gonna put him in C tier. He's all right. Ramses is Ramses is okay. Um, his ability, which gives you extra culture equal to fifteen percent of the production cost of a uh, completing a building, and I think it's thirty percent for a wonder. It's good. Uh, that is a good ability that allows you to get a, a super fast injection of culture and can basically jumpstart you early game. It's like a mini uh, Ayudea from like the, the city-state Ayutthaya, which gives you the culture based off the production cost of the building when you complete it. I find it a little bit, a little, I don't know, how do I say this? These abilities that are based off of when you build things are a little bit less reliable than just getting something all the time. I feel like it's like a very obvious statement, but a really good example, and we'll talk about it later, is Sunduk versus Sejong. Sunduk gives you uh, like the culture and science from your governors constantly, always, whereas Sejong gives you a boost of culture and science uh, from each era. It's like, it's not really 
Like there's there's something that you're gonna get constantly always, and you can stack modifiers with. Versus, whereas this is like a a, a small little injection, but you only get it at specific times. Now, with Ramses, it's you're gonna be getting buildings most of the game, and the wonders is like the wonders is a little bit more RNG dependent, but buildings you're gonna get like the 15% culture boost uh, constantly. So that is a little bit better than say for example Sejong. Uh, so I have him in his C tier mostly because Egypt is on its standalone, a decent sieve. Uh, Egypt has the Sphinxes. Egypt has the Mariano Chariot Archers. Egypt has the extra production towards Districts and Wonders uh, as part of their kit. And culture, equal to 15% production of a building and 30% for a wonder, does synergize with the production costs that you get from the Egyptian kit when you're playing as Ramses. I, however... It's another one of those sieve issues for new leaders is that on paper, it sounds better than it is in practice. It's still very good. Sorry. It's still good, but it's not as good as you think when you're thinking like, oh, how am I going to stack all of these districts wonders and get all this culture boost immediately? And it's like, a, it doesn't work like that, unfortunately, in sieve. It, it's, it's good, but it's just not, it doesn't give you the power boost that you think it does. London in it. Sorry. 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 <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're moving on to England. Uh, we're going to first jump into uh, Eleanor of Aquitaine of England. <laughs> uh, this is this is a, uh, a sieve that you might be going, uh, Boas, didn't you hate this sieve before? And uh, you're right, I did, but I was wrong, and I was dumb. And Eleanor is a good sieve. She is a pretty decent sieve. I think... I think it was a little bit of being like, uh, it's Eleanor. I just want to go culture. Why does she have to go production? Blah, blah, blah. And I was like, I wasn't really thinking critically on how good that Eleanor of England can be. So with her, she still gets the extra. She still has the Royal Navy Dockyard. She still gets the extra production towards like industrial zone buildings. Um, uh, she also, but like, I think for me, it was like one of those things where it doesn't really synergize with her great works, like causing loyalty per turn. But then I started playing her and I was like, she has a coastal bias. You can build Royal Navy dockyards, which means you can go Navy Dom and build great works at the same time uh, <laughs> because you can, you get the British Museum. So you can go like archaeologists alongside of you could just get great works go domination loyalty flip while you're while you're going domination at the same time and you have a half cost harbor and so it's like i thought about it i was like you know this actually isn't that bad this is a pretty good sieve you can you can utilize your industrial era production bonuses really well while also gaining culture and great works at the same time so she's obviously not like a strictly culture sieve like you would with Eleanor of France um but the fact that you also gain extra uh oh, sorry extra production from industrial zone buildings stock stockpiling extra resources and getting royal navy dockyards you just treat her as England with a little bit of culture abilities to city flip stuff now that doesn't happen all the time it's not like the perfect way of of winning a domination victory but if you are going dom you're you're generally going to be getting golden ages while the AI is going to be getting dark ages or normal ages. And you can utilize that to your advantage by just flipping cities without having to take them over. Because if you take over like their capital and then like their second highest pop city, you're going to flip all of the cities around them. And so you can just kind of go take that city, take that city and then move on to the next sieve. And that's kind of what I liked about playing as Eleanor. I was like, Oh, I, okay. I get it now. I get it. I still don't think it's like incredibly powerful, but I think it's, it's decent enough to bump her up a whole tier. So I have, I have Eleanor up in C tier. Uh, I'm sure Ursa will be happy with that. I know Ursa loves Eleanor, <laughs> but I, I'm sure he's also going to be like, well, she's not, not as good. And I'm like, that's, that's fine. Each of us have our opinions on it, but that's how I feel about Eleanor. I think she's definitely better than I thought she was, but I still don't think that she, there are once again, that those two magical words, power creep is being introduced i think if the new leader pass didn't get introduced she might have been even to b tier but leader pass is introduced and uh and we'll, we'll get into that into two sieves here so the next the next england is going to be straight up victoria of england uh and i have her into b tier i think that england is a a very good sieve um specifically age of empire england victoria 
she gets the Royal Navy Dockyard. She gets the Sea Dogs, which I find the Sea Dogs not really that important. I, I miss the Ship of the Line, man. That's kind of something. I'll t okay, you know, I'll talk about that in a second. I'll, we'll we'll skip. We'll wait until a little bit. But I miss the Ship of the Line. Um, red coats are really good. Uh, also, the city being like founding a city on a continent that it's not England's home continent gets a free melee unit. So if you do like mid game settling, you can get red coats for free and then go like you can supplement your navy with free red coats. Um, you also get extra trade route capacity. Uh, and, and anytime you build a Royal Navy dockyard, you get a free. Uh, you get a free melee unit it's, it's naval melee unit right yeah a free melee naval unit i think that's the thing that stands alone the difference between victoria versus eleanor and that's probably why i thought like eleanor was so bad because with victoria's kit it's like super obvious what you want to do right you want to build coastal cities you want to get royal navy dockyards you want to um expand a lot and so every time you settle a city you gain a free melee unit as well as a and then you build the Royal Navy Dockyard and you get a free naval unit as well. So now you have this massive Navy fleet that can just go out and completely destroy every single city. And you get like extra production from your industrial zone. So you go like Harbor, Industrial Zone, Adjacency, stupid stuff like that. You get, uh, you get tons of military engineers. So you can use the military engineers to build railroads, to build like there is so much with her that you can do. Uh, when it comes to Navy Dom stuff, that it, it makes her, like, so much better than, than Eleanor, which is why I have her into B tier. She does what Eleanor wants to do, but better, because, once again, the Vanilla Civs tend to be better at the alternate leaders, generally, when they split them and make them do other things. Generally. That's not talking about Pirate Creep, that's just kind of in general. But... This is one of the exceptions, and this one was, I had a tough time not putting Steampunk Vicky, which is Age of Steam Victoria. I almost wanted to put her into S tier. Age of Steam Victoria is really good. It, she is very, very good. The only reason why she is not an S tier even though I played the first time I played her, I got like a turn like 186 science victory is because she is dependent on her leader bonus ability. Now she is going to be another Civ that is sitting right here, right on the borderline. I'll put, I'll put them right here. I'll put these Civs right here, right on the borderline with these other Civs because she is so damn good. Her bonus ability gives her plus 10% production in cities that have industrial zone buildings for each industrial zone building so a total of plus 40 percent once you get up to power plants additionally you get plus two production to every single strategic resource so what you do is you build you go animal husbandry first on the uh research tree and then you get a horse and then you get <laughs> then you get these like plus four plus three production plus four food plus three production uh pastures and you go the pantheon that gives you production to strategic resources. So you get these like plus four food, plus six production horse pastures from like turn 10. And then you're like, all right, game's over. Like I have that in my capital city. I'm going to have so much production in the early game that I can just rush industrial zones and harbors and get like, it doesn't, the harbors like don't even really matter at this point. If, if you took out the the Royal Navy dockyard and you just applied her as a, a strict science sieve, like kind of treated her like Germany where you just rush uh, industrial zones, the extra production, like 40% extra production um, is insane. And I think that that's kind of like one thing where we can take a mini segue and talk about here is modifiers and civil multipl multiplicative modifiers in civilization six. We'll get into it when we talk to talk about the Kamai as well, but modifiers are stackable in Civilization VI, and that's one of the reasons, and that's how myself and other Deity players are able to snowball so hard versus the AI. There, I've been getting some comments lately on my YouTube channel that are just like, this guy is cheating, he's using policy card cheats to get his yield so high, and it's like, you just don't understand how multiplicative modifiers work in civilization six a fantastic example is taking 
a highly scientific based civilization like we'll just say sunduk of korea for example you take sunduk who gets her campuses her so ons almost are going to be four plus four adjacency every single time right so you run the so you have a plus four campus you get you run natural philosophy which gets turns it into a plus eight campus and then you get rationalism which gives you the extra production or sorry the extra percentage of science based on your campus if it's plus four or higher so you run those two together you're getting like i i, I have to hold on let's look it up let's look it up rationalism civ six rationalism gives you 50 percent extra science from buildings in campuses if it's at least pop 15 or at and at least plus four adjacency so you can get 50 percent on top of your eight from buildings in the campuses if it has at least plus four adjacency and then once that city hits pop 15 it gets an additional 50 percent and then you start stacking that with other modifiers from city states there are city states that give you percent bonuses like geneva for example geneva the oops geneva civ six geneva uh the city state geneva gives you 15 percent extra science bonus output when you're not at war with any civ so that's another 15 percent on top of that plus kilwa kisawani if you build kilwa kisawani let's say you build it in your capital you stack that which kill kisawani gives you a 15 percent boost to the yield provided by a city state so say you're sued with one scientific city state the city that built Kilwa kisawani gains a 15 an extra 15 percent boost and then if you sues two or more city states of that type so say you sues two scientific city states you're now gaining an additional 15 percent boost to all of your cities which includes a 30% boost total from Kilwa for your city that built Kilwa. So not only do you have natural philosophy and rationalism and a plus four campus, now you're stacking 15% from Geneva, 15 additional 15% from Kilwa Kisawani to that city that built it, plus an additional 15% if you've sued two city states. And then you run the policy card that gives you 5% science from all the city states that you were suzerained with. Now you can start to understand when you have like 15, 20 cities and you are stacking all the stuff and now you can get like 3,000 science per turn just from this, from stacking policy cards and modifiers. That's something that is not taken into account into Civ and that's what I talk about when I'm saying stacking modifiers. The same thing applies with Victoria and the Age of Steam with the... <laughs> 10% extra production bonus in cities that have an industrial zone building. And then you build Ruhr Valley, which gives you a percent production bonus based off of the or the mines in your city. That's Ruhr Valley here. Ruhr Valley gives you plus 20% production in the city that's built Ruhr Valley. And you get plus one production for each mining quarry. So you stack the 20% production on top of the 40% you're going to be gaining from uh vicky's age of steam bonus and every single city that has an iz is going to be insanely productive that means at the end of the game instead of having to worry about chop cities for going science victory you can just one to two turn space race projects in almost every single city that can build a sp uh, space port long story short age of steam is good she's almost s tier if she didn't have her dependencies she would 100 percent be an s tier civ but she does. And that's the only reason why I am putting her into A tier. There is an argument that she can be S tier because you can go you can go religion with her and stack work ethic on top of her productive bonuses. And that is something that you can do. But the fact that her early game can be nerfed a little bit by not having any strategic resources does kind of make her a little bit less than S tier. So I think a high A tier, nearly S tier is a good ranking for Victoria. I miss the ship of the line so much this was another sieve that i was very excited for when they announced that they're making her again but i i i think she's still good here we'll just we'll get right to it she's a b tier sieve she's still a good sieve because she is england and england is a good sieve overall the fact that you get two plus trade routes upon when you get your first great admiral and you also get three gold per district at the origin city that's a good sieve a lot of gold 
lot of trade routes. It's like a mini Portugal almost. And you get the Royal Navy Dockyard, so you get half-cost harbors. Uh, she's just a good sieve overall. Um, I don't think that she's incredible, and this is I think this is the reason why some of the sieves, for example, are not as good as they appear to be uh, because of how they were released in the leader pass. And I think one of the disappointing things about a lot of these sieves that are being released or were being released outside of, uh, you know, brand new, sorry, I should say leaders, all of these leaders that were being introduced outside of full on sieves being introduced is that they lack some of the things about a full sieve ability. So when they're like, Oh, it's the leader pass, new leader pass coming out. Look at all these leaders that are coming out. I was thinking in my head, I was like, Oh, we're going to get with, with, China with Wuzu Tian, the reason why I was so disappointed is like, oh, we're going to get the like the, the paper maker from the library, or we're going to get like the Chukunus, which are like an insane uh, unit with with Elizabeth. I was like, well, or we're going to get like the ship of the line or the crossbows. The ship of the line was like the one that I was like, oh, we're going to get a new unit, ship of the line. And I was like, nope, you're not getting any new units. You're only getting a new leader ability. Everything else, the Civ abilities are all staying the same. You're just getting a new leader ability, which means if you have a leader that has a unique unit, like Basil, for example, you don't get that unique unit. You just get the Civ unit. And I was like, I think that's like, if you take that into account with a lot of these Civs, it's just like, all right, they're, that's very disappointing. And that's kind of how I felt about Elizabeth. I still think she's a good Civ because she, she's a good leader because she is under England and England itself is a good Civ. But not getting the ship of the lion, man. Like, that could have... Like, I like I understand. And it, it's, like... I have mixed feelings about the leader pass. Because on one hand, it was free if you own all the DLC. But on the other hand, it was, like... I, I mentioned it before, but the leader pass kind of just felt like... We have a bunch of ideas that we're batting around. All we have to do is really just take a leader and just change their ability... And like it seems like it's almost the, I think the issue for me is that these leader abil these new leaders that came out into leader pass unless they're really good they just feel like if they're either really good and feel like brand new civs like Yongle for example or Theodora or they just feel like a modded civ like Wu like Unifier like Sultan Saladin and Elizabeth feels like a modded civ uh, and that's not a knock on to modders at all like Sucre Tax modded civs are incredible he they they uh they animate all them all by themselves and they have incredible unique abilities and unique units and all this stuff whereas like you see elizabeth and you're like okay you're just like a half-baked english civ without a unique unit um well it does have a unique unit it's the the england unique unit not the leader so rant aside elizabeth is good She's a good Civ. I'm fine. Sorry, I keep ranting about like random things. I'm going off script. <laughs> Another Civ that I had to play or that I played recently that I had to move them up in the rankings was uh, Ethiopia, Metalik. Ethiopia is a really good Civ, man. I am putting them into A tier. Uh, I They are way better than I was giving them credit for. Um, I like I had them ranked, I think, in B tier previously. But my god, dude, like, especially when you take out, now, if you add game modes and you put in secret societies, like, uh, you can argue that Ethiopia is S tier because of the fact that you're, their, their base ability of synergizing uh, the extra faith and, um, sorry, the extra culture gold and science from the faith that you accrue is just a, it's such a good such a good ability and then you stack that with void singers it's like it's crazy good so with ethiopia obviously cities founded on hills receive extra science and culture equal to 15 percent of their faith output they also get combat strength for being on hills um you also get plus one faith uh for each copy of a resource that the city owns um you also get I think it's half faith for trade routes uh, in the origin city, um, which means it's like a, a mini Chinggeti. So if you stack Chinggeti alongside of it, you're, you're going to be getting a ton of faith per turn. Uh, their unique tile improvement, the Rock Hewn Church, is absurd. 
plus one faith, and then plus one faith for every adjacent mountain and hills tile. So you build rock hewn churches on it has to be on a hill, obviously, but build a rock hewn church next to a mountain, next to hills. You're going to be getting like these plus two food, plus one production, plus seven faith tiles, which is insane. They can also can't be destroyed uh, by natural disasters, so you can build them next to volcanoes. Um, they get pillaged, but they don't get destroyed. Whereas, like, you know, if you built a, a, a mine next to a volcano, it, it erupts. There's a chance that it gets completely destroyed. It also destroy. Uh, sorry, it also provides tourism and faith uh, from the faith that you have after researching flight and appeal, so you can use them next to preserves and stuff like that. It's just such a good tile improvement. Ethiopia is just a very, very good sieve. Uh, Metallic especially is a, like, Metallic on top of the Ethiopian abilities is just so good. I have, I had to bump them up to A tier. Playing them recently, I'm like, man, you can kind of just get away with doing whatever you want almost with, with Ethiopia. Downsides, you have to settle on hills, otherwise you don't get the science and culture bonuses. Um, but you get so much faith per turn that, like, even if you didn't settle on a hill, it kind of negates that. You can be like, all right, I just don't get that extra bonus, but I get a ton of faith. So uh, I have I have Ethiopia up in the A tier. Like I said, if, if Void Singers was a possibility, they, there's an argument they could be S tier. Uh, Ethiopia is very good. Je suis un nanana. No. Ce n'est pas possible. Oui. C'est possible. Black Queen Catherine is one of those sieves that's a really good example of being okay on deity versus ai but being a fantastic sieve when it comes to multiplayer for example for example um she's okay gains plus one level of diplo visibility for with with every encountered sieve so you have automatically plus one diplo visibility without even spying on them and then you can get a free spy when it comes to castles and they all start with a free promotion so you can gain really early spies and basically get a hundred percent spy completion rate of like siphoning funds, for example, versus the AI. I find the spying stuff. I already talked about it with woo. It, it doesn't work as much as you would like it to, or if you do, it's just not as impactful. Now, you know, siphoning funds is, is really good, but that also means you have to take up a, a very valuable policy card, uh, the uh, the green policy card with Machiavellianism in order for your spies to be basically 100%. And I find that running that card, because you have to be running it all the time for your spies to, to be gaining the extra 50%. And especially mid to late game, I want to be running things like uh, Whistlebunken or I want to like pop in um, uh, Diplo League real quick so I can like uh, so I can sue city states and you know once you pop in Diplo League now you gotta wait like three to four turns before you get your next civic and that just slows down your spies and stuff like that so when it comes to the spy stuff I find it tend to like in deity it doesn't really work as well as you want it to um, you do get however production towards medieval ren and industrial era wonders and it also doubles tourism from the wonders from any era so you really want to be focusing on culture with black queen Catherine because uh her chateaus also well her chateaus are nerfed uh, but they cannot be placed adjacent to another chateau but you still get tourism equal to its cultural output um it, once again i find her to be a little underwhelming when i'm playing her there are other civs who just do culture better than her uh and that just comes down to that just that's just what it comes down to other civs do culture better than her her guard imperials are a v they're a very strong unit, but like I always find it so weird. And I think that's why I hate. Like, I know that every sieve has to have a unique unit. That's like the whole point. But I always find it so weird when you have these sieves who are like, I'm so culture dependent. I want to focus on going peaceful and doing all these peaceful things, and then you have guard imperials who are just like, I'm gonna fucking knock you out <laughs> like go the i mean i guess you can argue that you can go domination with her and this is why i say she's really good at multiplayer because you get a spy super early you get extra diplo visibility towards people you want to kill and your guard imperials do insane damage and so you can get a lot of extra combat strength versus people in multiplayer when they're generally not expecting it and versus the ai and all the extra bonuses they get it still works but it doesn't work as well as you want it to um 
There we go. I think I just don't like France as a Civ that much in, in Civ 6. I think everything about them is kind of underwhelming. Uh, yeah. And so we'll go into Magnificence Catherine, whom uh, I think is just a worse version of Black Queen Catherine. I find that the uh, the Catherine's Magnificence project is just like... Oh, it's a court festival project, right? It's culture and tourism based on the number of excess copies you have of luxury resources. That is just like such a unique niche ability that it's never really going to come into play and be like it, the only time I ever use it is if it's like late game and I just like put every single city running court festival projects. But then at that, the problem with that is that at that point you don't have a lot of production. So you're not finishing those projects very fast. And this is, this is a problem. This is the problem that I get with is that some of these abilities just don't make sense because I get it. I get what you're trying to do here. You're trying to like work a project so you can get tourism faster. But most of the time when you're running a culture game, your cities are not going to be very productive. Um, you're using like engineers or you're chopping out wonders. You're chopping out theater squares and stuff like that. And so you're not going to have a lot of base production to, to pump through these court festival projects to make any meaningful advance towards the tourism victory. It's just, they don't like the only time that it works really well, there was a, I did make a video where I, with the help of a viewer, I won a culture victory. It obviously was very rigged. Like we set it up where there was like, ton, like a bajillion, uh, like I was surrounded by luxury resources and stuff like that. And I just chopped out court festival projects and won a culture victory in like 40 turns without ever meeting anybody. That's a like, that's rarely ever going to happen. Although it did happen in a multiplayer game <laughs> in CPL, but that's because I think it got nerfed. I think BBG nerfed it after that. Um, regardless, Catherine Magnificent Catherine is just that's that's my that's my ranking. This is whatever. <laughs> but the final French leader, Eleanor of France. I really like Eleanor of France, man. Um, I think, I think she's a, a great Civ. Okay. Well, great. I keep saying these words and I don't mean like great should be like a and above. I think she's a good Civ. How about that? She's a, she's a very good Civ. <laughs> she does, she does exactly what her kit wants her to do. You want to gain a lot of like you, you want to gain extra production towards wonders, which is like, cool. You build a lot of wonders. You want to gain a lot of great works because each great work in her city causes foreign cities within nine tiles to lose one loyalty per turn. You go heavy into culture, build a lot of theater squares, get a lot of great works, put them in your forward most cities and cause other cities to flip. And when that happens, generally when a city flips, it goes into a free city. But with Eleanor, it flips into her empire immediately. So you can just do this thing where you're flipping cities over and over and over again because you're just gaining a ton of great works and, uh, and you have a ton of culture and then you expand your cities. Those cities get great works. They flip more cities and you just become this massive blob of a, of a cultural empire. Now, the problem with that is that sometimes you don't get a lot of great works and sometimes you don't get the wonders that you want to build because you're, you're France. Um, chateaus are still like, all right, but I don't know. I think she is the best French leader by far. But I also, it's just, once again, there are other civs that just do culture better than her. And so I have her into B tier. I think she's good. Uh, she's my favorite one to play out of the three, but she's not fantastic. Ambiorix, mustache man. I had Ambiorix very highly rated before. Uh, and this, some people are, might, might get a little angry at me for this. They might, they might be a little mad that I am now putting him into B tier instead of A tier. And uh, you better be like, wait a minute. Why is that? It's this thing called power creep. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, you said the word. He said the thing. It, Ambiorix is a good sieve. He gets really good early game production. He gets really good early game culture, honestly, just because of the way that Ambiorix works. But... There are just some civs who just do it way better than... Well, not way better. There's civs that do it better than he does. And 
I find that his limitations are his downfall. Uh, you have to need, really get a lot of mines because if you don't have any mines in your uh, starting location, you don't get the extra culture. You also don't get the extra adjacency bonus for districts. Um, and you also don't get the culture bomb. Now, another thing too is that you don't get adjacency bonuses from other districts. And you also can't build your districts next to your city center, which I find like those really weird, unique rules for adjacency and districts can either both be a really good thing or a really bad thing. Uh, example, Sunduk, example, Batru of Vietnam, and example of Ambiorix of the Gaul. Now he is a, like the Gaul are still a very good Civ because you get the Oppidum, which is a half cost, in, half cost industrial zone that is unlocked with iron working instead of apprenticeship, which is pretty, that's a pretty big deal. It means you get a super early industrial zone. And also Gacetes are a very good unit in that they can, like, I'm sure you've seen the meme of Gacetes fighting a tank because of all the units surrounding them. Uh, if you don't know what they do, they gain, uh, it replaces the warrior. It receives plus 10 combat strength and fighting units with a higher base combat strength and also gains combat strength uh, with, uh, with units around it. Now that's just because of the gall uh, bonus of plus two combat strength for each adjacent military unit so you can literally fight tanks with Gaisate if you wanted to um don't recommend it but you know you can uh <laughs> all in all because of the power creep that was added to Civ, i felt like i had to bump the gall down to uh b tier it's a high b tier it's probably along the lines of this but it's still a b tier because it once again other civs just do it better um and his production well i don't know if do it better is the right word but his production and early game boost and culture is a little bit reliant too reliant on his dependencies versus the stuff that you get from them so i bumped him down to b tier i think he fits alongside of like really good civ or good civs along like you know montezuma and uh, is a good example and, and Pedro is a good example and Poundmaker is a good example of just they are good sieves at what they do I think Ambiorix might be a little bit better but because of the power creep that was added into Civilization 6 the leader pass it bumps him down a little bit Tamar this is going to be a this is going to be a surprising one I think for some people this is a big jump for Tamar of Georgia we stand Tamar now. Tamar is in B tier. I'm so sorry I did this to you before, Tamar. I was just playing her wrong. Sorry, I just hit my desk. Tamar is a good Civ, y'all. Uh, don't sleep on Georgia. Now, the early game leader of bonus, Glory of the World, is a little... Well, half of it is a little reliant on RNG. Killing unit provides faith equal to 50% of its combat strength. So if you have some early game barbs and you go barb hunting, you can get a Pantheon really fast. You can also use that faith to, you can accumulate that faith and possibly help buy your great profit really early on. Now that part of her leader bonus, I don't care about much. It's her next part. Each envoy sent to a city state following Georgia's majority religion counts as two envoys. Now you might be wondering like, oh, why does that, why does that matter so much? Because with her, there is a nice little ability called Papal Primacy. Let me go to it here. Papal Primacy in Civ 6 is... Whew, oh, it is... Wait, where did it go? Where is it? There it is. Papal Primacy is so good in Civilization 6. Now, whenever you send an envoy to a city-state, it adds 200 religious pressure to that city-state. Now, you might be saying, okay, 200 religious pressure. That's not going to flip it. It's not going to turn into your religion. Unless you send an envoy to that city-state for the first time and you run Diplomatic League at the same time. Now, Diplomatic League allows you to gain... Your first envoy sent to a city-state counts as two envoys. So when when you send an envoy to a city-state and it adds 200 religious pressure to that city-state, that technically now adds 400 religious pressure to that city-state because you're sending two envoys to that city-state. And generally, you're going to be able to send... That's going to convert that city-state to your religion, which means 
an envoy sent to a city-state following Georgia's majority religion counts as two envoys. So all in all, that one singular envoy turns into three envoys and you can suzer in that city-state. And now, now you can kind of see where her, where she goes bonkers because what you do is you can, you, you can suzer in literally every single city-state in the game and go absolutely bonkers with, I, I think she is a very underrated science-based civilization now you can skew it a little bit where if you put a bunch of science civs in your empire you're gonna be able to like seize all of them she's also it's the same thing can be applied for culture as well but she is a very good civ in the fact that you can also defend yourself really early on because kevsers are a really strong unit they replace the mounted arms now the the part that i hate about that is they're in military tactics and men at arms are in uh apprenticeship which is the middle of the tech tree whereas military tactics is on the uh is on the top of the tech tree and that's where you unlock pikemen and so it's i always found it kind of weird that in order to get kevsers you have to go to the top part of the tech tree which is what you don't want to do if you're going science especially uh it's also a weird spot to put them in um i i find they are insanely strong, and maybe that's the point, is putting them up there, nerfs them a little bit so they're not too strong. But the fact that they replace Man at Arms kind of just makes, like, I don't know, it just feels, it feels weird to put them there. So, um, uh, additionally, the other thing that makes her so strong is dedications chosen at the beginning of a Golden or Heroic Age also grants their normal age bonus, improving era score. So, if you get a Golden Age in say the classical era not only can you get monumentality golden ages you can also get the uh the monumentality the normal age bonus improving era score and <laughs> and then it just basically allows you to snowball golden ages you can get the extra era score from monumentality to whenever you know you get plus one uh era score from building a district or if you're feeling cheeky and you get the you get a free inquiry golden age you also get the plus one era score from every time you get a eureka for a tech if you wanted to you could um also her unique wall is in siege tactics and it's incredibly strong it also gives you faith in tourism when in a golden age there are a lot of there there are a lot of really good things about tamar that i think are really underrated now that doesn't mean she's a like incredibly strong civ but she's just a very good civ that you can utilize it's kind of like Rough Rider Teddy, where you utilize envoys super smartly and can suzer in every single city state. But with her, on top of that, you have religious bonuses too. So I'm a believer. I'm a Tamar believer. We stand Tamar. This one. This is gonna. This is this is gonna be an interesting next two civs. We are on to Germany now. If you know me, you know my feelings on Germany. I am not a good Freddy player, uh, but I understand how strong he can be. But here is a fantastic example of the words power creep and how it applies to Civilization VI. I'm bringing Freddy down to B tier. People were mad at me for putting him into A tier before and then dropping him to B tier previously. Now, that previous B tier might have been a little harsh. But with Fred... And the addition of Ludwig, which we'll talk about in a second, there's almost no reason to play Freddy because Ludwig is just better. Um, the only difference between uh, Freddy and Ludwig, obviously, is that Frederick Barbarossa gets the extra military policy slot, which the fact that now the industrial zone uh, double production bonus, the 100% adjacent, the adjacency bonus from production zones is added as a military policy card does give germany a little bit of an edge frederick a little bit of an edge for that part of it but just build alhambra if you want that extra policy slot i don't know i find i don't maybe late game it's where it matters because you can run well actually at that point it doesn't matter at all because you're see that's that's the thing right so that's the thing is that running running that industrial zone policy card is not going to matter because by the time it gets late game where you need an extra military policy card slot you only really need it for the extra resources for uh, aluminum um, and then at that point at that point you don't need the extra policy card military policy card because your industrial zone bonus adjacency bonus is now in a card uh, is now in an economic policy slot card that has industrial zone plus science in the same 
card. So never mind. I, the military policy slot does not matter for me. <laughs> it, it doesn't. It doesn't matter. Um, you also get X seven percent plus seven combat strength in fighting city states. I really dislike this versus DD AI because you would much rather have the bonuses of a suzerain city state than kill it and take it over as your city most of the time. Now. Frederick obviously gets the extra because it's Germany. You can build one more specialty district and the population allows. So you can go campus into Hansa into commercial hub. And that's kind of the general way to play him. The problem that I have with Germany versus Ludwig, sorry, Frederick versus Ludwig is the early game. Now there, like I said, the early game allows you to build two districts super fast. If you wanted to, you could even go religion science with him into Hansa commercial hubs. But I find that his cities don't grow as fast as you would like them to. So Getting a religion with him is kind of a moot point. Ludwig, however, and the reason why I find Ludwig so good compared to him, and I'm going to put Ludwig into A tier. This is going to get people mad. They want him into S tier. Ludwig's ability, the Swan King, wonders, even when they're unfinished, give plus two bonus, sorry, give plus two culture from each adjacent district. And all of those culture adjacencies turn into tourism once you reach castles. Now, you guys saw my like turn 87 Ludwig victory, and that was just a very, that was a lot of luck in re regards to uh, getting relics, candy, and reliquaries, and then using my adjacency bonuses to add extra tourism on top of that. We're going to take that aside and say that's just a, a misnomer. That's like, because that is a really cheeky, incredibly lucky sieve or win. If you treat them like you should, as an early game culture powerhouse into late game science production, He's just better than Frederick. Frederick's downfall was always his early game. In his early game, you struggled with culture. Frederick makes up for that. Right when you unlock a wonder, you like say you get Great Bath and you have a floodplain, you can place Great. You just place Great Bath and then just never work for it, never work it the rest of the game. AI is generally going to build that. So now you just get free plus two culture until the AI builds it. So you're going to get free plus two culture for like 20 turns. If you have a spot to place Hanging Gardens, just place Hanging Gardens. Now you're going to get plus four culture. And if you place a district around it, now you're going to get like plus six, plus eight culture. If you're really good at Civ and you're really good at district management and can kind of look, at, look into the future of where you're going to want to place your districts, your industrial zones, your dams, your aqueducts, where you're going to place your adjacency bonuses, you can get really good at placing wonders temporarily. And hey, maybe you build that wonder and it's great. Now you just have free culture. But placing wonders temporarily that the, you know the AI is going to build like Hanging Gardens, like Great Bath, like a Temenanki, those like that. And now you're just going to be getting plus two, plus four, plus six, plus 10, plus 12 view district correctly, culture for free in the early game and not really have to worry about monuments. That's where Ludwig prevails over Frederick. I still like Frederick and I still think he can be a late game powerhouse, but because of the all-encompassing power creep into Civilization VI, Ludwig is doing that thing where he makes Frederick a little less important than Ludwig. Ludwig can take what Frederick does and does better. The main reason is, one, you still get the Hansa because it's a Civ, ability, Civ unique district. Two, we don't care about U-boats. U-boats are kind of irrelevant in what we want to do with Germany. Three, you still get Imperial Cities, which is the ability to build extra districts than the population allows. Um, and four, culture is king. I explained this earlier. Culture is super important, especially in the early game, because then you can utilize policy cards a lot faster. And plus, Ludwig, you kind of get culture for free without having to do anything. Early game, you're not going to be building districts on your floodplains, right? You're not going to get floodplain. You're not going to use your floodplains uh, or even districts along the river as a science-based sieve until you can get an aqueduct and or a dam and you do like aqueduct hansa uh commercial hub adjacencies where your hansas have like plus 12 production and your and your commercial hubs have like plus six you're not going to worry about that by the time those wonders that you place down on those locations disappear so ludwig is an a tier he's not an s tier because of those limitations and those limitations are are you going to be able to have a spot to place Great Bath? Say you don't settle next to a floodplain. Now you can't place Great Bath. Now you can't place a Temenanki. You can only place like Hanging Gardens. Are you going to be able to place Oracle? Are you going to get Oracle? Maybe. I don't know. There is a p 
possibility that you can't even utilize his Swan King bonus to get extra culture. And that's why I have him in A tier, because he can't use that bonus every single time. 9 out of 10 times, yes, he can use it. But on those times that he can't, he becomes basically like Frederick uh, on par with him. So That's where I have Ludwig. Don't yell at me that he's not an S tier. Uh, because the difference between Ludwig and Yongle, for example, is that Yongle is going to get his bonuses all the time, no matter what. You can just pop in a Legia. It doesn't really matter if you have low production. That just means you're getting free stuff for that time. And you can do it in every single city of his. Whereas Ludwig, you're probably only going to be able to utilize his extra culture bonus early on in the game. Uh, unless you can, And then his bonuses might be able to help you out later if you do some creative districting. Uh, but Yongle is a guarantee. Simon Bolivar, Grand Colombia. Uh, this one hasn't changed. Simon Bolivar is still an A tier. Um, I think he's just like a solid A tier, maybe lower A tier. Uh, but he's just he's just a good Sif. I mean, there really is not a lot to talk about with Simon Bolivar. I think he's one of the few Sivs that are S tier in multiplayer. But when it comes to single player, uh, he's just a really good Sif. You get extra movement from all of your units, right, with Grand Columbia. Um, plus one movement for all units. Promoting does not take a turn or a movement point, which is kind of crazy. Um, Haciendas are a really good tile improvement, plus two gold, plus one production, half a housing, and then you get plus one food for every two adjacent plantations. Um, and then they also receive plus one... Pr the plantations and your Haciendas receive plus one production for every two adjacent Haciendas. So basically you just... You have a plantation down, and you build haciendas around it, and you gain a lot of food production and gold uh, from them. Now, the only problem with that is that they are unlocked with mercantilism, which I think is a little bit late. Uh, it's a really it's it's good for a mid game like oh now all of your cities are gonna need, need a boost to grow and gain a little extra production. I find mercantilism is a little bit late, especially if you are playing Simone as intended, which is super fast early game domination by using your uh, Comandantes to gain extra motion and stacking them with great generals. It's it, it, if I find that the culture doesn't really come at that point, but because he's so strong at what he does, because of the like you know his strength to focus is what do you want to do? Build unit, unit go very fast, stack Comandantes with great generals, <laughs> extra combat strength, move fast, kill unit, take city. Like that's a. Uh, that's basically what you want to do with, with Simon Bolivar. And because of how strong that is, I think that lands him in the A tier, and I think that's a pretty safe bet. We are about halfway done through the man. So I'm like halfway done, and like, look at. We still have so many to do. It's so crazy. Uh, we're on to Greece now, and we're going to go with Pericles, Mr. Beardy Boy. Um, Pericles is another A tier Civ. Pericles, this hasn't changed from the last Civ, the last tier list. He's a really good Civ, man. Um, his early game is like the only thing that's kind of holding him back. And it's not even like that big of an early game disadvantage. Uh, the fact, the only thing with him is that you have to build a Acropolis on a hill. And that's really about it. Hoplites are incredible units. Uh, and plus the fact that Necropolis is a half cost theater square though is like, uh, it's, I don't know, man. Acropolis are really good. <laughs> The, the main thing for Pericles for me is that he gets 5% culture per city state that you've seized. And that just, that's, that goes back to what I talked about with stacking percentage modifiers in Civilization VI. Sta stacking 5% culture on top of ping. Oh, yeah, that's another thing I didn't talk about when the stacking is the Pingala governor. The, the, extra, the percentage culture based off of Pingala's bonuses on top of Kilwakasawani, on top of your, your, policy cards it just he gets out of control really really fast um that's pericles is like a borderline s tier sieve along the lines of like byzantium the only thing that like he struggles with like i said is early game and that's barely anything early game he obviously wants to go culture i would argue that and there i think there's a really good argument to be made because of how strong he is at culture you can actually kind of use him as a science based sieve where you go theater square, you go religion theater squares, you get a lot of cities and a lot of culture really fast. 
And then once you hit around turn 100, turn 110, then you start placing campuses down and industrial zones. And so it's like this weird, like, reverse science game where generally with science, you want you get your campuses down really fast and you you start to get culture so you can ramp up. Whereas like this is like you get culture really fast, a lot of cities, and then you get science later on. And it's a really weird and unique way of playing Pericles. Uh, I would try it if you haven't, because it's a lot of fun. But I think that's like his only weakness is is that it's just like his versatile. Like he is very versatile, but he only really kind of wants to do one thing. And he is a little bit dependent on hills. If you don't have any hills, you're like, okay, well, I guess you don't get to work <laughs> theater square. So I think A tier is fair. Whereas Gorgo, uh, I have her in B tier. Gorgo is still a really good Civ. Uh, don't don't get me wrong, because she still is Greece. The only thing with Gorgo is that she is a little bit more dependent on RNG. And when I say RNG, it is it can maybe RNG is a bad word. It's creating situations where you can utilize her leader bonus ability. So with with Gorgo, you have to. Her leader ability is that you provide culture equal to 50% of a unit's combat strength when you kill it. You also get plus one combat strength for units uh, um, for each military policy card in your government. So you kind of want to go early game dom with her and then maybe transition into culture. The only problem with that for her is that I find it's that's a a dependency issue. Uh, you know, say you aren't get, getting raided by barbs, you're not going to get extra early culture. You don't have a a Civ nearby that you can utilize killing their units really early you kind of lose out on culture um, another thing too that maybe isn't really that is part of the power creep but it was introduced a long time ago a lot of these civs that have early game units um, got nerfed because of the introduction of men at arms because of the introduction of trebuchets of line infantry there was a big period of time where swordsmen were insanely good that the, there was it was swordsmen and then it was musketmen and there was no uh, men at arms right and so units that had unique swordsmen or unique early game units like for example the hoplite that's not a swordsman obviously but it's a, a spearman replacement um, the hoplite is a really good unit but because th there are men at arms uh, because uh, there are trebuchets hoplites right uh, they like melee units destroy anti-cav units so obviously like hoplites you know you want to put them next to each other they get extra uh bonus abilities but because of the introduction of units that are just better than them and you can get them super fast kind of makes their power a little bit as less important um so there are those things that tend to put gorgo down a little bit more than let's say she would have been uh if they hadn't introduced those in the past now, don't get me wrong, she's still a good Civ, but she's just not as good as she was before, so. Uh, or at least as as she could be. There are too much, there's too many variables thrown in there to make her a good Civ, so. Or a great Civ, I should say, on par with Pericles. Be here. Oh, Matthias. Matthias? Matthias? Hungary. This is a Civ that I think... People might get mad at me here. I love Hungary. Hungary is one of my favorite civs to play. But I think I may have overvalued them before. I still think that they are a decent civ. But I'm going to put Hungary into C tier. Like I said, this is one of my favorite civs to play. Um, you get extra combat strength and movement from levying a city-state. And the city-states can be... Uh, gets extra you get two envoys from the thing that city state basically means you can let keep them forever well you sues that city forever more or less um it also is only like 70 like you can get swordsmen and upgrade them for like 25 gold or something stupid like that uh you can levy a city state and then upgrade them to whatever unit super super fast um additionally the pearl of the danube gives you plus 50 percent production for districts and buildings across from the river of a city center so you can just negate his city state levying ability and go like pure district building across a river where you build everything across a river and you get it every district becomes a half cost district if it's across a river now i find that this ability is another ability where on paper it sounds amazing but in practice is not as good as it can be and it's a little situational 
I find the situations a little bit too hard to to remedy into getting a really good game going with Hungary. And I find myself relying more on the Raven King bonus of levying units and killing other AI with them. So that's why I have him in C tier, because if you want to do what he does really well, you want to levy city-states, you want to use those city-state units to kill the AI, and you want to upgrade them and keep them upgraded throughout the rest of the game. The only problem with that is that the AI tends to be boogers, and you'll have all of these units, and you're like, man, I have, you know, I'm pouring envoys into this city-state, then all of a sudden you lose all your units because some other AI puts envoys into that city-state, and you're like... What am I supposed to do for the next 10 turns? Now you can't do anything and all of your momentum and your tempo, as I mentioned earlier, is gone. Uh, that doesn't happen all the time, but it happens a lot for me. It's happened too many times for me that I'm like, I, I'm like, all right, I know this is going to happen at least once in this game. Um, I also think his, his thermal bath is kind of like, that's, it's one of those, it's one of those unique infrastructure that doesn't make sense with this kit. Like it, it, it's a historical building, not necessarily a kit building. Two amenities from entertainment to all cities. It replaces the zoo, so it's a tier two building and an entertainment complex. Unless you're going science with them, you're rarely going to be building entertainment complexes in your domination games. So it doesn't really make any sense for you to build this. Um, so it's kind of like, uh, yeah, yeah, okay. Hazars, okay. Hazars are okay. Matthias's unique unit, the Black Army, is really where I think Hungary shines. Is you you get the levying and then you upgrade the units into Black Army, and it's 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 kind of it's kind of impossible for. Uh, um, Oh wait, no, you can't upgrade. Yeah, sorry, it's it's kind of impossible for the for the AI to stop you because you have a corsair. Or you have a corsair who basically hits as hard as a cuirassier and gets plus three extra combat strength for each adjacent levied unit. So you treat it like a gaisete, where you have your black army and then you have levied units around it, and that let that black army does like like seventy combat strength, and it's it's insane. Um, it's a it's a really strong unit. Now, obviously, the problem with that is it's still a light cavalry unit, so do with that with, with what you will. Um, all in all, I I moved Matthias down into C tier. I think if previously B tier, I think was more fair if the leader pass didn't come out. Um, and also, we are ranking without game modes. Obviously, with game modes, and you have Hamiko. Hamiko Matias turns into like an S tier sieve because nothing can stop you. Free levying, uh, free envoys, free levying. It, it's perfect. Patch a cutie. Look at this cutie. Oh, Inca. I love playing the Inca. Um, the Inca are another B tier sieve. I think I had the Inca as an A tier sieve before. This is this is a an instance where the formula for power creep and the fact that he kind of is a jack of all trades he follows the similar path of pound maker where the Inca have really good early uh really good early game um, stats where you can get the uh, the unique tile improvement the terrace farm which is unlocked uh with uh oh it's unlocked immediately you just have to get builders so you can get like some good like plus six food plus two production terra farms or plus plus five food plus three production like hills stuff like that you can get some really good unique tiles now the problem that i have with the inca is i end up getting these insanely good terrace farms and i have to kill them for districts and i think that is that's kind of something that I, when it comes to civ 6 versus like civ 5 for example is i get really annoyed with killing good tiles for districts but i mean the districts make up for like the you know make they allow you to win the game so also the fact that you can work mountain tiles are really good um with the inca basically you grow your cities really tall and then you do with that 
whatever you want to do at that point. Most of the time it gears towards science because you have really tall cities. And when I say tall, I mean really high population cities. And then you can use those high population to what you want to do. In this case, you want to build a lot of districts and a lot of production. Um, I think before the leader pass, he would have been A tier, borderline A, B tier. And I think he just sits as a solid B. Whereas if you play the Inca, you're generally not going to have a terrible game. And you're just going to have a good game most of the time. So not too much to say about Patch of Cutie. B tier is pretty fair, I think. Oh, oh we're, getting, we're getting to this part now, huh? I don't know what it is about people's infatuation with Gandhi. Um, and I think that maybe my D tier ranking before was a little harsh. But I think D tier is just very applicable for him. Because once again, I'm going to keep saying it throughout this throughout this uh this video and i'm sorry but you have to hear me keep saying it power creep makes civs like gandhi super obsolete um like there there are some like decent things about gandhi as india like you get the uh plus five faith immediately for each civilization met so that means you can get a pantheon really fast you also don't receive uh you, enemies also receive double war weariness against you but for the ai that doesn't really matter they don't care about war weary weariness really the thing, the thing with India, with Gandhi specifically, well, sorry, the thing with Gandhi, or India, God, dude, how do my words get The thing with India is that you get the, you receive the follower beliefs of all religions with at least one follower in them. So you're going to get that inherently by having trade routes with the AI. Your cities that have trade routes are going to have at least like one follower from another religion to them. So you get the follower beliefs with them. So that's like kind of nice. And you also gain plus one amenity with them. <sighs> I find that that just doesn't really matter for me. Like it can't, I don't know. It Those abilities aren't powerful enough to... cascade himself incredibly far versus someone like uh theodora for example as a faith-based civ or someone like tamar for example whereas tamar's ability is very straightforward and you know what you want to do with it and you're going to utilize it and it's going to work very well the fact that follower beliefs can leave your city makes it like oh i have choral music for two turns okay i don't have choral music anymore um or if you don't even get a religion, you probably will with, with India, let's be real. But if you don't get a religion, then it just like kind of turns into like, all right, who's going to spread the religions to me? Come on, give me your religions. And it ends up just being like, it ends up being not like, once again, this comes down to practice versus paper. Paper, great. Practice, not great. Um, Varus are really good. Don't get me. Varus are a really good early game domination unit. But unfortunately, with Gandhi, you don't really care too much about going to war. You're not trying to go to war. Uh, Stepwells can be a good tile improvement. One full housing. Love that. Plus one food and plus one food of placed adjacent to a farm. Okay. Two extra food. Two, plus one faith of placed to adjacent holy site. You get plus two faith with feudalism. That's a little far down. So can be good they do produce they do prevent food loss from drought so if you get a drought in your city you don't have to worry about that but it it is one of those like you get it through irrigation but i find it not as good as um uh let's say like a, a terrace farm for example the, the faith is nice but um it's it's okay i like i feel like i'm ragging a little bit too hard on it it's okay uh all in all i think gandhi is kind of i don't know what people's obsession are with with him like uh, like i even recently played him and being like all right i'm gonna try and like make this as like i'm gonna try to be as objective as possible i'm gonna play him like how he should be played i get a religion and then i let all the other religions like you know i'm not gonna i'm gonna make sure i have the majority religion but uh, you know allow them to be in my city and it felt like it was so hard for me to get other religions in my city that weren't my own and so i think like in the game that i was playing i had two follower beliefs and it would be like i would have like religious communities <laughs> and mine or i would have like two cities that had feed the world and then my religion which is better than nothing but it just like it, i don't have any any extra abilities that have faith so 
Gandhi is in D tier. Chandra Gupta is also in D tier. I wish I liked Chandra Gupta more. Um, the you can declare that early game war of ter territorial expansion super early. It's with military training instead of mobilization, which is very very early. Um, you also get plus two movement and plus five combat strength for the next ten turns. So it's kind of like how Cyrus gets the extra movement and combat strength. I find that though is a little bit too late. Um, especially when you get Varu. Varu is in horseback riding. And I find that the, the time, by the timing doesn't work out as much as you want it to. Now you can do some like Varu rushes and, and kill like a city or two, but the AI is going to get crossbowmen really fast. Um, and they're probably going to get men at arms very fast and they get the extra combat strength. I find that Varu hit a, like they're really good up until a point and then they just hit a wall. Um, and you know the AI loves to loves to build uh, anti cavalry, so I find Chandra Gupta once like it's just I don't know. Every time I play him, I'm like, oh, it starts out good. You're like, oh, this is good, and then you're like, uh, mm. eh, it just doesn't feel as good to me. I don't know. Those are my thoughts. That's why you're watching this video. But you know who does? Guitar Jabe. We love Guitarja Bay. Uh, Guitarja is a B tier Civ. I had her as A tier before. I love Guitarja. But unfortunately, the good old power creep comes in and drops some of these Civs down a little bit from where they were before. Uh, Guitarja is just a fantastic cultural Civ. She can be really good at Devil Dom because you can faith buy boats with her, whereas no other Civ can. Uh, you also guarantee yourself to get a really good Pantheon if you get her starting bias next to a coast. Um, if you start next to a coast or a lake and you settle it, you get plus two faith in your city center, which means uh, by turn 12, if you settle in turn, no, by turn 13, I guess, technically the rollover, you're going to have your Pantheon. Most of the time you can get religious settlements around that between turn 12 and 14. I'd say like 60% of the time you're going to be able to get religious settlements. If not, you're going to get the next best one, which is probably going to be uh, God of the Sea because with Indonesia, you want to build Kampongs. And Kampongs are a probably my favorite tile improvement in the game. Plus one production, plus one housing, plus one food from every adjacent fishing boat. You also get tourism from food from flight. That's some fun stuff, but placing Kampongs around fishing tiles and then getting God of the Sea means you're going to have an insane amount of food and production early game. Uh, and then you also get the Jong, which is her unique frigate. And it's unlocked by mercenaries, not by square rigging, which means you can go early game faith culture into naval dom and get Jongs insanely early, like super, super fast. Uh, uh, and the thing with Jongs is they don't require coal or sorry, niter like frigates do. They just require to be unlocked, and you can faith by them. So what you do, what I tend to do, is I build a lot of cities early on. I uh, faith by a bunch of, um, uh, what are they called? Uh, quadrireams. And so I have, I, I'll, this is, the, we, it's called pre-building. So you faith by a bunch of quadrireams, and then you have like 10 to 15 quadrireams, and you save up a bunch of gold, and then right when you get mercenaries, which is the perfect time, you unlock mercenaries, You, uh, which gives you the policy card Professional Army, and now you can plug in Professional Army, which gives you a 50% discount on all unit upgrades, and now you can upgrade all of your quadrireams to Jongs for only 50% of the cost, and now you have these more powerful frigates and movement, higher movement uh frigates that you can just completely destroy the AI with. It's like, she is such a good sieve for that. Um, the only problem, like I said, is if you have to you spawn next to a coast, or you don't spawn next to a coast, you're kind of... Oh, sorry, out of focus. You don't spawn next to a coast, you're kind of a, a vanilla sieve. You do get the extra adjacency bonus for uh, your specialty districts next to a coast or a lake tile, so that, you know, if you have non-Madal... Non-Madal Guitarja is like a, probably an S-tier sieve, so... I really love playing Guitarja, but I understand that she has her limitations... And that's why she's in B tier. Um, but if you haven't played her, go try playing her on a coastal map. Do what I say. Go faith culture. Get 
uh, get holy sites in theater squares next to your coast. Build kumpungs next to fish tiles. Go god of the sea. Get faced by a bunch of quadrimes, and then right when you unlock jongs, upgrade them all to jongs, and then go destroy the AI. It's uh, so much fun playing her. Another fantastic example of power creep, uh, but he's still in A tier, is Hojo Takamune of Japan. Hojo is a, like, Japan itself is a fantastic Civ, or, fant yeah, well, fantastic Civ, but Hojo is a really good leader that was just bumped down a little bit with the introdu introduction of Tokugawa. If I was to put him on here, he would be, like, A-. minus. You get plus five combat strength for units fighting on on coastal and shallow tiles. Divine Wind. Um, it's a. <laughs> you also get. Uh, it's just a fantastic leader bonus. You also get half cost districts um, that are immune to hurricane damage. And so that means you could build half cost encampments, holy sites, and theater squares. So you can do like half cost holy site rivals uh, Peter because Peter gets a half cost holy site in the. Lavra. Um, additionally, you, you do get the Meiji Restoration, so you receive plus one adjacency bonus. So you can get these half cost plus one major adjacency or standard adjacency bonuses for uh, for your districts built on the coast. And it's just like you have this, you could just play SimCity with him and get a lot of high adjacency districts as Japan. Now, the reason why I bumped him down a little bit compared to Tokugawa is because Tokugawa gains super early, gains crazy early bonuses from trade routes, uh, whereas obviously Hojo doesn't. But that, but Tokugawa also gets Meiji Restoration. So he, that's the main important part is that, yeah, like sure, Hojo gets the half cost Holy Site and Theater Square Districts, but Tokugawa makes up for it by you don't have to trade with other city states. You can basically isolate your, sorry, civs. You can isolate yourself from other civs. So you get these plus one culture, plus one science and plus two gold for every specialty district and internal trade routes. Cities within six tiles of Japan's capital are hundred percent loyal, which I mean, that's like, that's a whatever thing. That's kind of like how the Maya work, except for loyalty with Hojo, um, sorry, with Tokugawa. Uh, but it's his trade routes that are, absolutely insane like getting like yeah you get the you get the negative 25 percent yields and tourism if you do international trade routes but domestic trade routes stacked with uh all of the other trade route abilities uh through policy cards make tokugawa like insane like i think i if i remember from my tokugawa games i was gaining uh uh like i think it was like plus like stacked especially if you if you get what's his name if you get uh kumasi in the game i was getting like plus 12 culture trade routes from and i was building harbors in every single city and so i was getting like it was like plus 200 like extra culture just from internal trade routes it was it was insane and the fact that you can get that on top of doing the other stuff that you want to do with tokugawa just gives him a little slight edge over hojo hojo is still a very good civ and that's why i have both of them at a tier but this is a, a little bit of the, the power creep where Ho Tokugawa is just a tiny bit better. And if we were to make this like less linear, this is kind of what it would look like. Um, but both Japans are A tier. They're both fantastic solid civs. And if you wanted a good civ to play, you can choose either one of them. They're both great. And now it's time for my favorite. I zoomed in again. My favorite Civ in the entire game. And our second S tier Civ here, the Kamai. Chai Varman of the Kamai is so good. I For a while, I had him above Peter. I still think Peter might be better. With Yongle, it, it's, you can, there's an argument to be made that each of one of these Civs is better than the other. The Kamai are so damn good. They are one of those civs where it doesn't matter if you can build like high adjacency uh, holy sites. It's like you don't. It, he's so good. Holy sites grant food equal to their adjacency bonus. You receive a plus two adjacency bonus from a river, and it grants two housing built next to a river. So obviously, 
you want to get the Pantheon uh, River Goddess because now you get the extra, like uh, it, the extra bonus of uh, of building your holy sites next to rivers. So you have tons of amenities. It also gets a culture bomb around it, which is like that's whatever. But on top of that, your cities with an aqueduct receive plus one amenity and plus one faith for every population. <laughs> Then, on top of that, we haven't gotten to it yet. Your farms also receive plus two dis plus two food adjacent to an aqueduct and plus one faith adjacent to a holy site. So you do these things where you don't have to, but you do these things where you have these holy sites built next to a river, built next to an aqueduct with farms around them. And then you get into the Prasat. The Prasat is the unique building of the Kamai that replaces the temple and is probably one of the more important things about the Kamai kit. You get plus six booth, which is or plus six booth, plus six faith from building it. You get the relic slot, you get the citizen slot, but the main thing about this is that you get plus two faith for each religious city state with six envoys, <laughs> and that turns into plus two faith from uh, religious. City oh, that Ethiopia pack gives you plus three envoys. <laughs> you get plus ten tourism if the city has between ten population and nineteen population. And 20 tourism if the city is 20 or higher, which is very easy to do with the Kamai. And the big thing about it is you get plus five, plus half a culture for every population in the city. So you're going to be getting... Almost all of your cities are going to be 20 plus population. So each of your cities are going to be giving you at least 10 culture per pop per turn. On top of the tourism. On top of the culture from tourism from getting flight. On top of... All of your other stuff, like, you don't even have to go feed the world. I find myself going choral music with the Kamai, and your your cultural output is just bonkers. You gain so much culture and faith per turn, and all of your cities are growing so that like, you can literally do whatever you want. And the main reason why these faith-based civs are so strong, and why... The Kamai, why Yongle are in S tier, aside from their abilities to kind of do whatever they want, is because Faith is the most powerful income in the entire game because of one specific reason, and it's this mechanic called Monumentality. Monumentality, when you're in a Golden Age, allows you to Faith buy civilian units, which in the early game are going to be traders, builders, and settlers. And they also cost 30% cheaper? It's 30% or 15%. I don't know, remember off the top of my head. So you get percentage-based discounted on civilian units. And if you're playing a, a high faith-based civ, you can faith by settlers in the classical era, which means you can use your production for other things. So you use production for building holy sites. You use your production for building units, for building buildings. And you use all of your faith... You take one city that has Magnus in it, and you faith buy, you, because you get so much faith per turn, you're just faith buying settlers, and by turn 100, you're going to have like 15 cities. And because of how the Kamai work, all of the cities are going to be growing super fast. You can use your population from those cities to gain a lot of production. You could go work ethic if you wanted to, or you can go feed the world, or you can go choral music. It doesn't matter what you do, because you're going to have 15 plus cities by turn 100, 110, and you're going to have 20 plus cities by turn 150, and you're just going to be snowballing so hard out of control with these civs because of monumentality. If you get a golden age in a classical era as a faith-based civ, you're going to be getting a golden age in every single era from here on out, because you have unlimited faith. You could faith by units. Sorry, well, yeah, if you get Grandmaster Chapel, you can faith by units, but you can faith by civilian units, settlers, all that jazz. You can faith by apostles. Um, you can faith by to spread your religion. And then you can faith by great people, which is another big one because you're going to move into theocracy. So you get a faith discount on faith buying great people. So you can get every single great engineer that you want, every single great scientist that you want. You're like, there are no limits when you're playing a faith based civ that has a golden age because. Okay, that's a lot. Your only limit is how much faith income you have. And with the Kamai, it kind of feels like you have no limits. Uh, J is a very, very good Civ. And it's it's really, you have to make a very compelling argument on why, like, which one is better between Yongla and uh, J. And, spoiler alert, Peter's also S tier. But we'll get to that later. 
Jay is just very good. He's my favorite Civ to play by far. All right. We mentioned it before. Well, we. Who is we? Me. Me. Sorry. Uh, I mentioned it before, but this is the... If you wanted an example of what power creep is in a video game, and I know I've said it a bajillion times already, but look no far further because this is... This is exactly what power creep is in this, in this game. So original Congo, I was never a fan of the original Congo anyways. Uh, like I said before, the fact that you literally can't go religion, you can't build a holy site, makes, it just like takes away one whole aspect out of the game of the Civ. And one of the strongest things in Civilization VI is monumentality. It's, if you're not playing with monumentality, which is like, the beauty of, beauty of Civ is that you can kind of do whatever you want, right? You don't have to play one strict play style. And that is... But Potato made it, like, a really good... Potato made a really good point a while back of, like, Civilization VI. The correct way to play Civ is to abuse monumentality Golden Ages and Faith and or Gold by super cheap settlers and expand that way because then no one can stop you. You can't really do that with uh, with Vemba, uh, uh, Anazinga, as 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 the Congo, because you can't build holy sites. You can't build holy sites, nor can you found a religion. Now you get the beliefs of of the majority religion, um, not just the follower beliefs, but you get like the all the beliefs. But you can't get a religion. You can only use spread your religion through theater squares. And the only way you really get faith <laughs> is through your relics, artifacts, and sculptures. And so it's like, those are like really cool abilities. You get like all the, all the yield like stuff. You're like, Ooh, pretty yields of all of my great works, having food production, faith and gold. Right. But that doesn't happen until like the mid game. And so your early game, you're, you're like, you suck. <laughs> right. Like, yeah, you get a unique swordsman, uh, their Mabebas, but once again, like I mentioned earlier, those become obsolete a lot faster because of men at arms. Men at arms were introduced, and all of these sword swordsman replacements aren't as strong as they used to be. Thirdly, you can't, you can't, don't stand, don't tell me that you build neighborhoods and think that they're a good district. If you are trying to play Civilization VI, at a super high level and win the game as fast as possible, you are not wasting your production and a tile for building a neighborhood. <laughs> yeah, I don't care if, it, if it's a half cost neighborhood and it gives you plus four gold. It's not happening. They don't, neighborhoods suck. Don't build neighborhoods unless you're building biosphere or you need a city to have a little bit of extra growth. Just don't build them. They're a waste of time. They're, they're a waste of time. It's just like some other people tell you not to build scouts. Build scouts. Don't build neighborhoods. Waste of time. The fact that they get a, dis a, a unique neighborhood. <laughs> Who cares? <laughs> I, I will die on this hill. Like, the M Mabanza are like, they're cool, I guess. But they don't really matter. They, they are like, <laughs> yeah, they're unlocked with guilds. So they're like kind of early, but they like don't it's, it's wasted production. It's wasted production on things that you do not need. It also takes up a tile that you can place a district on instead. He's D tier. He has some useful abilities like you, you know, the tour. You could still win tourism with him because you get the relics, artifacts and sculptures like and you also get the extra great artists and musician points so he still is a sh like he can be strong with culture but why play him when you have her <laughs> you still get the nikisi civ ability of relics artifacts and sculptures granting the yields from them but now you can get a religion you could build holy sites and you also gain a mayan ability where well, sim not the exact same mine ability, but cities that are on the same continent as the capital, including your capital, <laughs> receive plus 10% to all yields, while cities on another ca continent receive 
minus 15 percent. that's kind of how the mayans work right the mayans outside of their like little six tile receive minus 15 percent. now people are gonna be like oh no you get minus 15 percent yields oh that sucks minus 85 percent yields on a city is still better than zero percent yields i'd rather have a city that gains 85 percent yields and then like i'd rather have a empire that has 20 cities where like say, we'll just say like 12 of them are on the continent so they receive 10 percent extra yields and then eight of them are not on the same continent, but they still get 85% of the yields. That is so much, and that is, so, I don't think you understand, like, it's the 10%, it's, once again, the 10% goes back to stacking modifiers, stacking the 10% extra yields, that's all yields. It doesn't just mean, like, regular yields, that's all yields. So you're getting 10% extra culture and science, stacking it if you can get killed by Kisawani, stacking it with Pingala in your capital, stacking it with all the other modifiers that I talked about before, on top of the 10% in your capital, on top of the fact that your relics, artifacts, and sculptures grant plus two food production and one faith and gold, on top of if you get reliquaries with her, which is kind of the, you should be getting reliquaries, meaning you're getting tourism from all of your relics. She is a very, very good Civ, and that's why she is an A tier. She's not an S tier. She's close. She's very, very close, but she is, she is 100% 100% in A tier. She is one of those borderline civs that is almost an S tier because she is so very, very good. Her Obviously, her limitations are getting a religion. If you don't get a religion with her, then you kind of just, you're basically Vemba, but with a holy site. But that's the thing, is that she can build a holy site, which means she can get faith, which means she can use monumentality. This guy cannot really use monumentality. And also another thing too, that also isn't talked about a lot, is that when it comes to golden ages, civs that can build holy sites can get golden ages a lot easier because they can get a holy site. They can get a plus three holy site, which is a splitted holy site, which gives you era score. They can get a religion, which gives you era score. And you can also evangelize your religion, which also gives you era score, which means you can build Mahabodhi Temple to evangelize your religion for free. There's a lot of arguments that I see in my channel that are like, you're just not playing the Congo correctly. It the faith doesn't really matter that much you are a strong culture sieve and it's like yeah he has some strong culture stuff but you can take all of his culture things and apply it to any other sieve and they're just better than him they're just better like i don't like i feel like there's like some i don't know there's some something that people just aren't getting is that like like i mean literally just like this like comparing these two she can build holy sites. She can get faith. She can do all of these things that he wants to do, but she can just do it better. She can get reliquaries. He can't get reliquaries. She can get faith to expand and build tons of cities. He can't do that. And you might be arguing, well, he can get like really tall cities by, you know, being next to rainforests and stuff like that. And it's like, oh, okay, she can do, she can get really tall cities too, but then also have faith. And faith by everything. And faith by great engineers. And faith by great people. And faith by literally anything that you want. And he can't do this. Like, I don't know. I don't I don't get where these people are like where people are coming from when they're saying, like, oh yeah, but like he's actually really good. And it's like, well, he's decent in one niche one one thing. He's decent in one thing. And that's getting some like getting a free apostle from a theater square. But it's like, okay, what are you gonna do with that apostle? Like, oh, that apostle has core music. Let's go spread that religion, spread the that apostle to that religion and to all of my other city states. But now I, or all of my cities, but I have 20 cities or I have 15 cities and this only has like five spreads. Well, now I can't use this apostle anymore. And now I see the AI with their wave of apostles spreading their religion that, you know, has Zen meditation, which I like Zen meditation. That, but, you know, I'd much rather have choral music than Zen meditation. And now those five cities that had choral music before just got destroyed. And now they only have Zen meditation. And I like, it, like, no, well, I mean, you can't even really utilize choral music anyways, because I don't have any, any shrines or temples. Like, do you, I, I hope I, I feel like I'm trying, I'm like repeating myself and it sounds like condescending and I'm being berating, but I get these, it's all the time. 
where it's like, I'm not trying to say that I am the authority on how to play Civ 6 because there are a lot of Civ 6 players who are better than me. I like Potato's a better Civ 6 player than me. I think Ursa Ryan's a better player than me. But I feel like I have enough knowledge and I feel like I am one of those players who's a really good player and I understand how to play this game. That just, he's, he's not good. He's not good. Rant over. A tier, D tier. <laughs> okay. I'm, cal I'm calm down. I'm good. We're free. Calm down. Uh, Korea. Sonduk. Anagasio. Sonduk's good. But she's dropped down to B tier. She was A tier. She's dropped down to B tier. This is a strictly power creep problem in this game. So... I've mentioned in the past before with Korea that I think Korea is a good science civ, but I know, do not think that she is the best science civ. And that kind of triggered a lot of people <laughs> uh, because she is an inherently a great science civ. She gets a lot of science. She gets a lot of science fast early on and she scales very linearly with science. <laughs> the problem is, I don't know if you call it a problem. I guess like problem isn't the right word. The thing is, I say that she isn't the best. She's still very good. Like I think the people will see that and I say she's not the best. And they're like, are you saying that she's dog shit? I'm like, no, I'm saying that she's not the best. The other civs that can do it better than her, surprise, surprise, are faith-based civs. Like Peter. Like the Kamai. <laughs> like Byzantium could be a better science civ than her. And that's because they have faith stuff that can lean into doing science stuff. Um she is still very good and we'll get into why she is much better than Sejong and why people are overrating Sejong by quite a bit. Um, I'm putting him into C tier. She's going into B tier. And that comes to, once again, stacking modifiers and reliability. Sejong, upon completing the first tech in a new era, you receive culture equal to double the current science output per turn. Now, he's going to have a pretty decent science output per turn. I This is like a super mini moon landing project where you get a injection of culture immediately. The problem, the difference between Sejong versus Sunduk is that Sunduk is going to have plus 3% extra culture and plus 3% science for each promotion that a governor does that has an established governor. If you're playing Korea correctly, you should have, you can play them tall, um, but you should have like uh, in our capital, for example, you should have Pingala and Pingala should have at least like, we'll say, we'll say when it gets to pop 10, you're going to have Pingala with at least three to four promotions. So you're going to be getting at least 12% extra science and 12% extra culture just from Pingala being established in that capital. But the, this is people are like, okay, that's like a decent amount, but that stacks with Pingala's ability of librarian where you get plus 15% increase in science and plus 15% increase in culture generated by that city on top of the plus one culture per turn for each citizen in that city and plus one science per turn for each citizen in that city when you upgrade to connoisseur and researcher so you're doing those things like i mentioned earlier where you're stacking modifiers and then you get oracle which gives you that extra uh the extra great people point people points per turn and then you stack that with well, you stack that with pingala as well then you get kilwaka sawani and you know you get all the modifiers that i mentioned before and that's the part that differentiates between Sunduk and Sejong, where Sejong you get it like once an era and you get that little boost. The early game, it's not so more apparent. Later on, it's very apparent. But with Sunduk, the reason why I like her more than Sejong is because this is reliable and you can use that reliability to just boost your way through the rest of the game. You're gonna be able to get to, you're gonna be able to get higher, higher culture and higher science faster than Sejong because you're gonna have extra modifiers that stack early on for the rest of the game whereas this happens for the rest of the game but only once and it's only happened five or six times whereas this is just constant it's a constant extra percentage increase of culture constant extra percentage increase in science 
that doesn't even include the extra mod. Another thing that I forgot about the modifiers is amenities. And this is why I love amenities so much. You're going to be getting 10% or 20% to all your yields, whether if they're happy or ecstatic cities from your amenities. It once I feel like maybe that's a video that I should make is that why amenities are so important. Because once you understand how modifiers stack in civilization six and the fact that you can keep all of your cities happy or ecstatic that increases the modifier stacking like it's hard to see civ in any other way than that um and so i think the korea's b tier and c tier uh i think she is a, a high b but because of civs like these like ethiopia for example like Hammurabi, like john Curtin, she is the other reason why I say that Sunduk is not the best is because she is also very linear in her science output where her Soans, the unique campus, is only ever going to be plus four adjacency. You get minus one science adjacency for each adjacent district. You're never going to have plus eight, plus seven, plus, you know, ten campus district adjacencies because of how the so on works the payoff with that is that you always get to utilize rationalism policy card uh but that also means that there isn't as like you have a you have a very low ceiling with 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 uh with so ons like you're like okay i have i, I know i'm going to be able to get at least plus four for all of my campuses but there is a higher possibility of getting more science with other civs because of district placements and stuff like that um uh and also the fact that you can uh you have more flexibility in placing your districts with uh with campuses because so ones have to be built on a hill they can't be encompassed with mountains you can't district around them they just have to be have mines around them uh and so there is a little bit more restrictions when it comes to so ons and that's why i have Sunduk and B tier because of small restrictions like that. She's still going to have a good science game, but there are some civs that can just do it a little bit better than her, like Hojo, like Australia, uh, you know, like Ludwig, like these two up here. Macedon. Oh, Alex, how far you have fallen. I have Alexander the Great into C tier. I used to be super high on Alex. I think I had him in A tier at 1.2, but. With the introduction of all the new civs, with the introduction of things like men at arms, Macedon isn't as great as he used to be. He is a little bit dependent on strategic resources. If you don't have horses, if you don't have iron, you're kind of, kind of a vanilla civ. <laughs> he does have the cool abilities. Uh, if you conquer a city, you get a free Eureka for each encampment and campus in that city. Uh, or inspiration for holy site and theater squares um you also if you if that city has a, a wonder in it which on deity the ai is generally going to build wonders so you capture a city all of your units get healed that's those are really cool abilities that even without their unique units those are those those stand alone to be like okay that at least brings you up to c tier now heteroi and Hi hippies hypaspists are both really good units early game Hypaspis, not so much anymore. They're still very good. They're, they're better than Swordsman, but because Men at Arms, you can unlock Men at Arms within like 20 turns of Hypaspis being unlocked. It kind of makes them not as impactful. Heteroi, however, are a little bit better in that you're more likely to have horses than you are iron. Um, the problem is that they are horses. So that means you can't really, once they get walls, they kind of become useless. Whereas Hypaspis, if you have like four Hypaspis, and a uh you know a battering ram that city's gonna fall in like two turns um but that's until they get men at arms uh this is kind of the the power creep of adding units like men at arms like line infantry where these civs like alexander especially considering he's a domination focused civ he only wants to do one thing and one thing only and that's domination so his strength of focus is very high because you're like okay Get, well, he also, you know, you get you get the Basilicoi Paides, which is like a, a very good building. You build encampments because you want a great general. You want Hypaspis and or Heteroi, so you can go absolutely bonkers into killing other civs. And then when you capture a city, you get a free Eureka or a free Inspiration. And if it has a wonder, you get your units fully healed, and now you have a city that has a wonder in it. 
He does. He excels in that, but in that one specific thing only. And because of things that have been introduced, those things aren't as strong as they used to be. Um, I think this might make people a little confused and upset. I think, I think there is some like being like, okay, yeah, he could be a little bit higher, but like B tier is the highest that I would put him. I just think, I think the addition of men at arms just really make a lot of these swordsman era sieves just really not as strong as they used to be. And what is the word for that? Say it along with me. Power creep. I will admit, I am not a massive Molly player. I'm not a massive Mansa Musa player, but every time I play Mansa Musa, I always feel like I am let down by what I am expecting him to be. He has a very unique kit where there is a possibility of him being incredibly strong, but the problem with Mansa Musa, the problem with Molly in general, is that desert tiles suck. Now you're gonna be like, wait, wait, wait a minute. You get plus one faith and plus one food for every adjacent desert and desert hills tile. And like, yeah, you're correct. You can get some extra food and faith early on. But he also receives minus one production <laughs> from from mines. Now you're gonna be like, okay, well that's this is a very unique way to play Civ. Like you just go work ethic work ethic with him. You get a you know a later religion and all that type of stuff. You get your holy side out. This is deity. This is deity. And it's deity on desert tiles with really low production. I cannot count how many times I've tried to play Mansa Musa and I have struggled to get a religion with him because I could not build a holy site or I, I could not, I got the holy site up and then I look and I go to the great people tab and I see four other sieves that are halfway through the great profit points. And I'm like, well, I, I can't, I, I'm not gonna be able to get a religion at this time. Or if I do get a religion, it's like super late. And then you have to play catch up for the rest of the game. Catch up, catch up for the rest of the game. I have Mansa Musa down into D tier. I will admit that once you get him going and you are through the game, you can be super strong by just gold buying and faith buying everything because of the bonuses on his Saguba and his Holy Sites. That is a possibility, but because of what I had mentioned earlier, these sieves up here specifically can do what he wants to do faster and better than he can before he can, um, right? If you're playing Theodora, for example, you're gonna be wanting to faith buy a bunch of stuff. If you're playing Ludwig, for example, you're gonna be wanting to gold buy a bunch of stuff. If you're playing, you know, Jay, you can you wanna do both, but you're gonna be doing that before Mansa Musa can even think about doing it. And I think that's the problem that I have with the Molly is that you're like on paper you're like oh like this is going to be great like i want to be able to do all of these things and buy everything and you're like yeah you can do that after turn 100 maybe a little bit later than that and by the time you're doing that other sieves around you well by the time you're doing that other sieves that you want to be you know that you you could be doing it better and faster with these sieves up here um i feel like if there was a sieve that you have like the the word you you could apply the word potential to, it's it's the Molly. The Molly have the potential to do incredible things, and there have been games where you've watched me play where I'm like, I have a perfect Petra city that's like incredible, but I don't get it like you know running until like way later. There's just a lot of potential with the Molly, but it's unrealized potential. And that's why I also have, I actually have Sundiata a little bit higher than Mansa Musa. I have him in C tier. <laughs> People are going to be like, Bose, are you okay? And it's like, yeah, I'm okay. But I think the reason why I like Sundiata is because he gets some extra production from great works of writing. You get great works of writing really early uh, from your markets. And also it costs 20% extra less gold to gold purchase great people so you'll be getting a lot of gold and a lot of faith to buy great people and you can accumulate those great people faster than Mansa Musa can yeah that's that's how I feel about it um I, f I feel like Sundiata just has a little bit better thing like a little bit better early game than Mansa Musa um and a little bit better a higher of a ceiling than he does could you switch these? Sure, but this is when it comes to the way that I play and the how I felt playing both of them fairly recently. 
felt like Sun Diablo was just a little bit better. Uh, doesn't mean that they're great, because they're not. <laughs> ha! Coupe time. Coupe's in B tier. Uh, I've always been a... I, I've always thought Coupe was just one of those sieves that's just a good sieve. He is a really another good example of just, you know, a good sieve who's got good abilities, who... You, you know, he specializes, he's definitely better at going culture, but he, he just has good abilities overall. And, you know, there are some limitations, like not being able to, you know, chop things as, as Coupe does, like, you can't, you can't remove features, you know, so, uh, not being able to, to, uh, choppy chop things does kind of suck. <laughs> um... But, like, a lot of the things, like, being able to get sailing and shipbuilding uh, without, you know, being able to enter ocean tiles is a pretty big bonus that you're not even held back from in the beginning because you get the uh, science and culture per turn before the first settle city is settled. So, you also get a free builder starting off and extra population, um, and as well as housing and amenities. So, it's like, he's got some pretty good abilities there. <laughs> Uh, the fact that you can't harvest resources, though, is, like, does kind of stink because I've had a lot of districting ruined by the ability to not harvest resources. Um, it does stink, but I find that that generally isn't the worst thing in the world because you get the extra, the unimproved, like, the production, the unimproved rainforest and woods giving the production and food is in the fishing, plus one food for fishing boats is, like, it's pretty, it's pretty cool. Um, there are just like some limitations, right? Not being able to harvest resources, can't get great riders. There's really no emphasis on going like, it's like, I guess the, the main emphasis for him is culture. Um, the Marais give you the culture and faith to uh, cities tiles and stuff like that, as well as the tourism. You kind of want to do culture, national park stuff with, with Coupe. Um, which makes him a good sieve. You can go science if you wanted to. Um, you can go domination if you wanted to because the Toa is a good unit. But just like Swordsman's is once you get men at arms, they're kind of obsolete and it's obsolete fast. So, but everything else makes up for Coupe being a good sieve. And I think, I think B-Tear is a really good fit for what his kit does and what he wants to do. Now Taro is such an enigma for me. Like, I feel like the Mapuche are a really good example of a multiplayer sieve and not a single player sieve. Uh, I have the Mapuche down into D tier. Your cities with an established governor gain 5% culture and production. When you know That was the one of the newest buffs that they did in the final patch for them. Uh, and then 10% combat experience. Um, and those numbers are tripled by taking over. So if you take over a city, you get 15% culture and production from having a governor in that city. Uh, you also get extra loyalty per turn. Um, Malin Raiders are an incredibly strong unit. Plus five combat strength within four tiles of friendly territory. Pillaging only costs plus one movement. So you basically get that extra promotion from light cavalry by getting pill like, so you don't have to promote to that to get pillaging. But I find that the combat strength and fighting civilizations are a golden or heroic age is more useful for the AI against you than it is for you against the AI. And that's kind of where I find that this is more, this is better as a multiplayer sieve than a single player sieve. Defeating an enemy unit within the borders of an enemy city causes that city to lose 20 loyalty or 40 if that sieve is in a golden or heroic age. So if you were fighting a sieve and they're like at 50, 50 loyalty where it's like not going up or not going down, and you kill a bunch of units around that city, that city's going to flip on the next turn. Uh, that can be really strong, but generally I find when I am going to war with the Mapuche, I'm in a golden heroic age, and the AI are not, and that makes all of my abilities kind of just useless. Um, this is why the Mapuche are a very strong defensive sieve. If you've played versus the AI on Deity, and you're in a golden age, and they're in, like in a, they're not in a golden age, you're like, wow, I literally can't fight into them because I have musketmen, and their swordsmen are killing me. <laughs> uh, that's also one of the main reasons why I think they're better for multiplayer because of that, because 
you are generally going to be fighting into more golden ages or you're going to be fighting a defensive as a defensive L lautaro um like i said molin raiders fantastic unit uh i think the chemimul are okay i find that the chemimul are a little bit more restricted and it's harder to get them to be super useful because the culture is equal to is equal to a tile's appeal so you're really only getting production and appeal so it's a very appeal based tile improvement it does provide tourism and you can get a lot of tourism uh like if if you if you like lean super hard into the the, the culture appeal based culture where you build like eiffel tower and then tons of chemicals around everywhere you can get a ton of culture and a ton of tourism from that but that's super niche and it's not a really popular play style. Um, so I just, I tend to find playing as Lataro not very satisfying or as good as he could be if you were playing versus on multiplayer, for example. D tier. Lady Six Sky. Uh, we're gonna go C tier. I have mixed feelings about Lady Six Sky. I think she is on the same lines of. She did get buffed with the, you know, the getting the the free builders for a brand new settled city. Um, you also don't have to worry about fresh water with her because you don't gain additional housing from it. But it also means you don't have <laughs> housing. Uh, you also get extra amenities for luxury resources adjacent to the city center. Um, but that's a that's a weird thing because based off of the Maya's bias. She's going to have plantation luxury resources in her sieve, in, in her area, and you want to s surround her observatories with luxury resources, so you're generally not going to want to settle next to them. Uh, also, luxury resources like um, that are that are plantations generally don't spawn next to rivers, and I guess, well, okay, never mind. The rivers part doesn't matter because you're playing as the Maya, but you still would rather be settled on a river so you can get water mills. I mean, I guess water mills don't really matter. Never mind. Take that. I take that back. That's a moot point. Regardless, I always find that the Maya are another classic of example of great on paper and practice not as good. Observatory building, especially without game modes, especially if you're playing vanilla without BBS, it's like it's hard to get like plus three, plus four adjacency observatories i often find myself only getting like plus two observatories when it comes to adjacency bonuses plus three um you you don't get you only get a minor adjacency bonus from i mean you do get some farms stuff like that but it always feels really weird to place observatories in between plantations and then get farms around it like i feel like the max i ever get from from observatories is plus three generally it's like plus one or plus two it's really hard to get plus three plus four observatories which means more often than not you're not going to be able to use rationalism to gain extra uh science from them on top of the fact that you also really only want to do the maya non-capital cities within like that hexagon range of six tiles of the capital gaining extra yields like, those are the ones that gain builders. And like I said, I said this before with the Congo. Yeah, your cities that are not in that gain minus 15% yields, but minus 15% is better than 0%. So you're still going to gain some decent amount of stuff. And you can overcome that by getting, like, having them all ecstatic and stuff like that. Even then, I find that she does not give you as much as you you think you're going to be getting with her like you still get a decent amount of yields you still can be a semi-strong science sieve um i think her real strength is her holche and that if you can basically turtle and do do what you want to do without having people mess with you because holche are so strong you don't even have to worry about going into crossbows uh because of how strong holche are so I'm still like sometimes I struggle I'm like do I put her in a B tier but I think I think C is more than fair yeah C tier C tier for the Maya <laughs> we're back to Kublai Khan Mongolia oh this is going straight into C tier uh, Kublai Khan Mongolia it's kind of what I talked about earlier with Mongolia too is that um, it, it really 
it's just I don't know, man. Like Mongolia is a decent sieve as they are, where you get like the trade. Like I guess Kublai Khan synergizes more with Mongolia than they do with China, right? Kublai Khan, you want to string along your inspirations by establishing trading posts as well as your Eurekas. And you also get, you get trading posts immediately with Mongolia whenever you establish a trade route. So you get those Eurekas instantly as Mongolia. Um, so I find there that it synergizes a little bit better as Mongolia than it does China. Uh, the problem, the thing is though, is that uh, Genghis Khan still has a little bit better abilities in the fact that you can get extra combat strength and so because you get a trading post you're getting the extra um diplo visibility which means you're getting the extra combat strength uh and i find that synergizes a little bit well with the extra combat strength that you get from cavalry units especially since the fact that you're building keshigs which is a cavalry unit so you're getting extra oh my voice is cracked you're getting extra combat strength with the keshig, keshig as genghis khan versus kublai khan they're both around the same, like, skill or, or ranking. Uh, I find... We'll, we'll just do it right now. I find Mongolia to be a little bit higher. I think Genghis Khan is a fantastic multiplayer sieve. If you wanted to, if you wanted to piss off your friends and you're playing multiplayer with them, pick Genghis Khan, get a spy as fast as you can, spy on them, trade with them, and then rusk musketmen as fast as you can go that route and be like i'm gonna be friends with you i'm gonna be friends with you and then right at the last second once you get your musket men get like a musket men core and you're gonna be doing like 96 damage to their medieval walls and kill it without even having like a battering ram you don't even need it because it's so strong um versus deity it doesn't work as well uh so i find them both to be okay I find base Mongolia a little bit better than Kublai Khan. At least with Kublai Khan, you get the extra economic policy slot. And the inspiration and Eureka stuff does synergize with the trading post establishing immediately. So there is that. But everything else, there's no... Like, uh, with China, I guess you could argue that Kublai Khan China, like... Oh, you can stack that with the inspirations from playing as China and building wonders and it's like Kublai Khan it doesn't really like it doesn't really work well that well together they're okay civs they're not great they're not bad but they're not great oh. that was my that was my Wilhelmina impression that was terrible <laughs> that was her when she's getting mad when you when she realizes you're not trading with her uh Wilhelmina good civ decent civ um she has uh really good bonuses of getting the extra adjacency bonus for building um districts on a river so build your campus on a oops build your campus on a river build your theater square industrial zone on a river that's it's fantastic you get 50 percent production towards dams um polders are a fan, probably one of my favorite top three tile improvement in the entire game plus one food plus one food for every adjacent polder now i wish that they worked the way that BBG works, that polders have to be at, next to at least three adjacent land tiles. So you have to have at least three of the hexes touching the the coast or lake tile to build a polder there. BBG is only two, and I like that better because I feel like you can actually utilize polders more. Um, the Dutch boat, it's fine. I generally, unless you're going full Navy Dom... The, the problem that I have with the Dutch boat is that you're not really going to be able to utilize uh, the seas that much because if you are if you want a good Wilhelmina start, you want to be settling next to floodplains next to a river. Sorry, next to floodplains on a river next to a mountain, not necessarily next to a coast. Um, so I find that to be a little awkward. You want to trade with her, though? Domestic trade routes provide plus two loyalty, plus two culture for each trade route sent to or received from a foreign civilization. So you can get, like, a little tiny mini Kumasi boost uh, when trading with Vilhelmina. So it's it's kind of nice, but I definitely feel that Vilhelmina is... got nerfed a little bit by someone like Tokugawa, for example. I think Tokugawa kind of took Vilhelmina's abilities and was like, I could do it better. Give me major restoration on top of domestic trade routes. Yeah, that's just better. Uh, 
the way I, I look at Vilhelmina is like a John Curtin and Tokugawa if they had a baby and it just wasn't as good as either of those two. Uh, so Vilhelmina is just is like a good Civ. Just just a straight good Civ. Harold! Oh, I don't know how to feel about Harold. Um, I have Harold in the C tier. I think like Harold's just fine. Harold's one of those weird civs, man, where it's very obvious that you only want to do one thing and one thing only. Gosh, my voice is... You can hear my voice cracking right now because it's just like I've been talking for like three hours straight. You obviously want to build his early game naval unit and pillage and do coastal ra coastal raids, right? Viking longships allowed you to uh, pillage enemy coastal lands and capture civilians by using the pillage thing. Like you can capture settlers and builders and stuff like that doing that. Uh, and you, whenever you do a coastal raid, you gain science uh, in addition to gold uh, for the whenever you pillage a mine, culture for in faith for quarries, pastures, and plantations, as well as the pillaging that you get from pillaging districts and stuff like that. So you really want to utilize, if you haven't seen it, I have a pillage only game with Norway. Uh, and that's what you want to do, right? You just want to go through pillage everything, use those boats to take Viking longships, to take cities if you can, uh, before those become obsolete and they are getting walls and stuff like that. So you can do some really super fast early game shenanigans by you know, settling on the coast, getting those boats, and killing coastal cities. If there are no coastal cities, you are a terrible civ. This is one of those few civs that, if you're not playing on an archipelago map, or you're not playing on, like, seven seas or something like that, and you don't spawn in the on the coast, or there's no AI near you on the coast, Herald is a god-awful civ. Um, Berserkers are a really good unit. I, I will say that the Berserker is a really good unit because it's a men in armor placement. It does require, it does a little bit weaker than the, since men at arms are a thing now, because before you would just have Berserkers destroying swordsmen, but now it's Berserkers fighting against men at arms and you're like, ah, it doesn't feel as good, but they're a very good unit. Uh, the one thing about, I always, I, this is one thing that I don't like about Harold is that the stave church Historically makes sense. Gameplay wise does not make any sense. Like, I always found it weird to be building holy sites as Herald when I want to be building campuses and harbors. And so like getting a holy site, which I mean you do get the you get an additional standard adjacency bonus, so you could do some like faith based stuff, but faith based holy sites does not work very well when you want to build big boat and pillage. And I always found that really weird. Um, so I didn't think that synergizes very well. Uh, now, at least... <laughs> Base Herald is better than Varangian Herald. I, I don't... This was... This was such a, like... Varangian Herald just doesn't make sense to me, man. I mean, I like I get it. I get what they're trying to do. Like, you levy, levying city-states costs 75% less... It also grants faith, culture, and science equal to 50% of the killed unit. It's like if you took Tamar and you took Matthias and you combined their abilities together, but with science and culture. And it's just like, it's cool. But the thing with Varangian and Herald is you don't get the, you don't get the early boats, which is what makes Herald. So that's the whole point of having a coastal bias is having the boats. Also, I find that it is super reliant on levying city-states and super reliant on having a city-state nearby in the first place. And if you don't have a city-state nearby, there's, like, which if you're playing with without BBS, that city-state's probably going to get killed by the AI. So you probably better be playing with BBS with this. But if you play with BBS, city-states are pushed towards the poles, so you're probably not going to have a city-state nearby. So you're super reliant on whether or not a city-state is nearby you. Now, you can do some really, like, cheeky things. I've seen White and Nerdy do this where he levies a city-state from, like, super far away. He levies that city-state, upgrades them all to Berserkers really quickly, and all of a sudden he has, like, a Berserker army destroying the AI. That's kind of a cool little thing that I, I thought was, like, oh, that's that's a unique way of playing it. But I find, like, outside of that, you don't snowball fast enough. You don't get enough, like, you don't get enough bonuses from all of your abilities that make it worth it. And I find Varangian Herald is just like, 
So funny how it's like all these other sieves on paper seems very good in practice is just awful. So, sorry Norway, it's not good, not good. Oh, a Manator. Oh, she's all right. C tier. I I had a Manator in B tier before, but because of rankings, I'm not gonna go too far into into Nubia with this. Um, because of new leaders being added to the the game her production towards districts and stuff is it's fine uh obviously you'd rather start in a in a desert because of how uh how nubian pyramids work but if you don't have good spots to place nubian pyramids uh, it's like ah, it's not that great um pitati archers they're, they're good i i like them i don't know man i feel I feel like Anubia is when you see the AI play it, you're like they're god tier. But when you play it yourself, it kind of feels just like, just feels weird. Like you get extra production towards districts, um, and it, I know that goes to forty percent when you build a Nubian pyramid. Uh, but I find, I just I find like Nubian pyramids coming a little bit too late for her early. Like Nubian pyramids are with masonry, so you kind of want to rush masonry. I don't know. I I I feel like. They're a very good... It's kind of like how Rome is. Maybe not as strong as Trajan. But, like, I I feel like Nubia is, like... If you don't have a lot of experience playing the game, they feel like, holy crap, like, this is an incredibly strong sieve. But then you play some other sieves who, like, kind of do what they want to do, like, get a little extra district production, extra bonuses and stuff like that, and you're like, okay, like, Nubia's all right. They're good, but they're not, like, incredible. And I feel like... Newer players to the game see sieves like Nubia, see sieves like Norway, and they're like, oh my god, how these sieves are so good. How do I fight them? Or how do, how do I play them that well? And then when you get a little bit more experience, you kind of realize uh, they're not as good as they're made out to be. Um, but that's how I feel about Nubia. I think that I would just rather play another sieve. Than them. I think it also comes down to, and this was the, the ranking, this is the problem with ranking wonders too, is that desert tiles are just not good tiles sure you have the nubian pyramid which allows you to get good yields from desert tiles but desert tiles in general are just terrible god-awful tiles and the fact that nubian pyramids are your only real source of getting good yields as compared to a wilfred who could build a farm on tundra but you can't build a farm <laughs> with I mean, yeah, you have like Nubian pyramids, but Nubian pyramids also don't give housing. Farms give housing. That's kind of like where I'm like, oh yeah, nope, housing versus housing. Also camps, you can get camps in tundra. You can't get camps in desert. Desert are such a bad tile that even with a good sieve like Nubia, it just brings it down because it's like, well, you're still in the desert. Like you're still in the desert. It's not gonna be as good as, you know, settling on a plains hill with, uh, you know, next to mountains as Australia. Like, it's just, it's just not. It's like, it's a, a factual thing. It's not. So, yeah, Nubia C tier. Sorry. We have less than 20 to go. Let's, let's stretch these out a little bit here. Uh, we've got the Ottomans. We've got Persia. We've got Phoenicia, Yadviga. We've got, we've got, a, we've got the Romes. We have, we have a couple more here. A little less than 20. We're almost done. That's crazy. Uh, let's just jump right into the Ottomans. Suleiman. Suleiman. Suleiman's a good sieve. Uh, I'm putting, I'm putting Suleiman, I'm putting the Ottoman in B tier. Uh, they they would be higher if they had a little bit more benefits than just pound you in the face with siege units. Uh, you get 50% production towards siege units. Um, you also get extra combat strength towards districts. Uh, whenever you conquer a city, you don't lose population. You also get extra loyalty per turn. Le extra loyalty, sorry, and extra amenities for cities that were not founded by you that you conquered. Uh, you also get Ibrahim, which is a unique governor. Uh, Ibrahim gives you extra combat strength for s units within 10 tiles uh, of where Ibrahim is established. You get 20% extra production towards all military units in that city. Uh, all your friendly units gain plus five combat strength if they're in the city that Ibrahim is in. Um, you also reduce like extra grievances and luxury. I don't really care about the last two ones. It's the the fact that you can 
Another thing about Ibrahim is that you can also put him inside a city-state. So what I've done is I've put Ibrahim inside of a city-state that's next to an AI that I'm fighting, and now I'm getting plus 10 combat strength from having Ibrahim nearby on top of the extra combat strength from like uh, having Janissaries, which are his unique musketman unit, which is another thing is that musketmen are, are very strong uh, and Janissaries are better <laughs> than musketmen. Um, they also only require 10 niter. Uh, musketmen are a little bit, have a little bit more longevity than swordsmen do. Um, all in all, all of that combined basically means that you're getting Tons of ball. You're basically have you have a bombard timing is you have a niter timing and if you don't have niter obviously you're gonna have problems but you have a a bombard Janissary Ibrahim timing where once you get all of those together you're gonna be melting cities super fast. Uh, you also have the Barbary Corsair, which is a basically Sinbad light, uh, where you can uh, you can coastal raid without costing any movement, which is kind of crazy. Uh, it replaces the privateer. Um, it's it's in, it's also invisible, except when it's within sight of city centers or it's adjacent to a unit. So a Barbary Corsair is an incredible unit, and that's why I have Suleiman into B tier because unlike Alexander, where they're both similar in that they want to go to war and they want to fight, the Ottomans have less restrictions. They're they have a timing, but it. It has a greater window than Alexander does. And unlike Alexander, the benefits from that window are a little bit more combat strength. You have extra benefits towards districts. And when you take a city, I mean, you, I guess taking the city with Alexander is equivalent to the amenities part of it. But the fact that you get all of the uh, Janissary unit. Oh, yeah. And the you gain one governor title with gunpowder as well. There's like, there's so many things about the Ottoman that makes him such a good sieve that he's so good at what he does that it keeps him up into B tier, even though he's not really the best at doing anything else. Whereas Magnificent Suleiman, he's still good. You get some of the good things with him, but you don't get as good as, you're not as good as regular Suleiman. 15% science and culture when a golden or heroic age. That is stackable, and it is very stackable. But I always find it kind of weird with the rest of his kit because you don't get any bonuses towards culture or science by going with the rest of his kit. The rest of his kit is geared towards going domination. So you do get plus four combat strength when you're not in a golden or heroic age against civs who are also not in a golden or heroic age. So it's like, okay... You get combat strength when you're not, and you fight ones that aren't either. And so you're like, uh, that's, you know, that's super good early game. But for the rest of the game, you just get extra culture and science when you're a golden heroic age. So you have to, like, rely on getting golden heroics. If you don't get that, your leader bonus is moot. Like, you don't... It's like, early game, you have to. If you don't get that golden age, most of the time the AI are going to have golden ages, so you don't get the extra combat strength. I always find... His is a little too situational for me to like. There is a possibility of getting really good science and culture modifiers stacking with Pingala with all of your stacking modifiers, but that requires you to get a golden age. And since your era score for your golden ages don't come until later, like the Barbary Corsair, the Grand Bazaar, which is his unique unit, uh, which replaces the bank. All of those things aren't going to help you get a golden age until the Renaissance era. So it's a little bit harder to get a golden with him early on. I find it harder to snowball with Magnificent Suleiman as compared to the, the original Ottoman where you can just go. You can just go and take city. So uh, I always find Golden Age bonuses outside of tomorrow a little weird. And uh, that's where I have the Ottomans. Oh, Cyrus. How you have fallen. I am putting Persia, Cyrus of Persia into C tier. Not only were you nerfed from Earth Goddess getting nerfed, which means Paradezas kind of suck, but you were also nerfed because of the power creep that was added with Men at Arms, which means Immortals just kind of didn't really matter anymore because you're like, oh, here come the Men at Arms. All right, Men at Arms now make Immortals kind of useless. Um, the Satrapies of gaining the trade route capacity with Political Philosophy, that's kind of cool if you're doing 
domestic trade routes because you get the plus two golden culture. The real thing is the surprise war. The plus two movement is kind of insane. Um, but I find that it really isn't as impactful as having just extra combat strength. And by the time you're getting immortals going, you have to like really hit these windows and timings. And I think that's why these civs like Alexander, like Cyrus, Cyrus used to be an A tier civ. Say to Alexander, and the fact that those windows are like so small now, you really have to hit that window and you have like one chance to do it. And if you miss that timing, you're super far behind because you pour everything into going into those windows. And if you miss that window, if you hit that window, it's great because then you steamroll someone. But if you miss that window, you're so far behind because all you built was two encampments and you have iron. And you're like, well, it's turn 75 and I have nothing to show for it. Um, Paradises were nerfed because Paradises are appeal based. You get plus one appeal to adjacent tiles. Whenever you got Paradises, you'd get you, you tend to go Earth Goddess, so you can get some extra faith on the side of it. That got nerfed when Earth Goddess only gives plus one faith now. He's just a weird sieve. Persia is just a weird sieve, especially with Cyrus. Uh, Nader Shah is also kind of a weird sieve too. I have Nader Shah under sieve under C tier as well. He was under S tier because his bonuses were broken. Uh, you used to get the plus two faith and plus three gold on domestic trade routes regardless if it was a city not founded by Nader Shah. They fixed that. You also got plus five combat strength for all units, even if they were attacking full health units. It used to be a bug where if you were, even if you were attacking like uh, wounded units, you'd still get the plus five extra combat strength, but that was fixed. So that made Nader Shah go from B to C because you could abuse his gold trade route or his trade route abilities and get plus two faith, plus three gold, plus two, sorry, plus two faith, plus four gold and plus two culture from the domestic trade routes. And it was plus one culture. It was, it was pretty broken early game. Uh, I did that in my previous playthrough of Nader Shah where I just did domestic trade routes and I was like, this is fantastic. I have insane combat strength and I have insane culture early game. Let's go. But that's been fixed. Kind of brings him back down to reality and he is no better than Cyrus. Sorry guys, y'all have fallen pretty far. Anokshem. We've got Dido here, we've got Dido. I love Dido. I think she is a fantastic sieve. I think she is another really good example of just a, a, a good sieve. Uh, I put her into B tier. Her city's with a Kothon, which is her unique harbor, half cost harbor. That gives uh, the cities gain the move capital project. I never use that. It's kind of a cool ability. It's whatever. Doesn't I don't care about that. We can just take that move capital project and throw it out the window for now because it's not going to do us any good in what we're talking about here. Um, you gain plus one extra trade capacity when you build a government plaza or any government plaza building. The biggest thing is that you get 50% production towards districts in the city with the government plaza. So you have some half cost. <laughs> you build a government plaza in your capital. You have a half. Now you have a half cost half cost harbor because you have a Kothon. So you have like a 13 production harbor. Uh, I don't know the exact cost off the top of my head. And then the big thing about Kothons is that gives you plus 50% production towards naval units. But the thing that I care about is plus 50% production towards settlers. You stack that on top of your capital city that has your government plaza. You build the ancestral hall, which also gives you plus 50% production towards settlers in the city that you're building settlers in that it's established in so now you're pumping out settlers every literal two to three turns with dido you just go you go magnus magnus gaming uh get provision where your city doesn't lose population from building a settler and build settlers in the city that has your government plaza with a kothon in it and you're like it's turn 75 and you're building like 10 settlers in the next 20 turns just from production she's a she's a really good crazy sieve now the only thing is that she is a little bit reliant on land if you don't settle on a uh, a city that can build Kothons, for example, then you don't get as much bonus as you could. Um, your settlers also do receive plus two movement while embarked, which is kind of crazy too. And they don't require movement to disembark. So you can do these like Archipelago or you do like a small continents game where you just 
build settlers, send them off to sea, and go spread everywhere, and she can be really strong. So, um, another thing with her, too, is that since Kothons are half cost and you get them super fast, I like to do... I like to forego monumentality with her and get free inquiry instead. Uh, free inquiry gives you uh, adjacency bonuses. You get science equal to your adjacency bonus of your commercial hubs and harbors. So if you have these plus four, plus five harbors, you run uh, naval infrastructure with, which is a policy card that gives you 100% adjacency bonus to your harbors. Every single city that has a harbor is going to be getting plus 10 plus 12 plus 14 extra science per turn because of how strong her Kothons are going to be so i think she's a very good sieve uh there are a little bit more dependencies than say someone for like example hojo or australia uh but it's up there she's she, there's a possibility of her there's an argument to be made for her to be a tier but i think she's just one of those solid sieves that uh doesn't really excel at anything um, but she is like, I think she's better than pound maker, for example, or the Inca. I think she's like right here. It's very, very close, but that, that's where I have, I, I have Dido there. <laughs> Moving on to Yadviga. You know, I really like playing Yadviga. And if this, this was a, uh, if this was a tier list that was like, let's rank all the sieves with how much I have fun playing them. This would be a very different tier list, but it's not. This is a tier list on how good is a sieve how stronger they are at their presumed focus, and uh, yeah, yeah, Vega's okay. I think some of it is Casimir the Third nostalgia <laughs> from Civilization V and uh, Winged Hussars when the Winged Hussars arrive. They're just so good in Civ Five, but like <sighs> Civ Six, it's like it's okay. Lithuanian Union is a is a decent bonus. You get gold culture and faith from relics so if you like go super hard into reliquaries with her then you can get some pretty fast culture wins i always found it weird that um uh that the encampments are forced trigger like culture bombs like i like you can do some like interesting culture bomb shenanigans with her but i just don't i just don't care that much about it uh the sukanis sukanice uh, it's a good it's a good building. It replaces the market. Like there's there's nothing to complain about that. Um the only thing is that winged hussars are just not that good in Civ 6. They replace the Quirious Air and they do only require 10 iron to train, but they they just don't they just aren't as impactful as they were in Civ 5. Um You do get one military policy slot and all uh, uh, converted into a wild card policy slot, so that is kind of cool. I do like that. But I find Poland one of those sieves where they're confused on what they want to do. Do they want to go faith into relics and go culture? Or do they want to go crusade into faith into domination? Now, you can do both, but I, I feel like there's a little bit of confusion into both of them. And she doesn't do them incredibly well. So you're kind of left with like a, uh, I don't really know how to how I feel about playing as Jadwiga. I, I like... If I was playing as Yadviga, I'd rather just play the Congo if I'm going culture-based stuff. Or if I'm going Faith Dom, I'd rather just go Byzantium, you know? So I feel like when you have sieves like that in this, you're like, oh, well, then why am I playing Yadviga? And that's kind of the point I've been trying to make this whole video. <laughs> ah, see. Portugal, Portugal, Portugal. Um, Joa is one of those sieves that I also really love to play. And people, are, I get this all the time. Why Portugal is the best sieve in the game. Why do you have him in B tier? He's OP. He gets so much gold. That's because if you don't spawn on a coast and you can't make use of his abilities to gain gold, he is a very terrible civilization. Uh, Poland can... Or, sorry, Poland. Portugal can only trade uh, through, what am I trying to say? Um, cities on a coast or a harbor. <laughs> you cannot do land-based trades unless they have a harbor or they're on a coast. Um, and so that means unless you're playing like an archipelago game, unless you're playing a coastal game or you have a sieve that spawns on a coast nearby you, you will not be able to utilize his bonuses at all for trading in the early game. And that's the whole point of playing Portugal is because you can just get 
lots of trade routes really fast and buy everything. Um, now, if you are on a coast, and as you've seen in my archipelago games with them before, if you're on a coast, you can just take over the game completely because you're going to have so many trade routes and so many, so much gold per turn that you can go monumentality with him and utilize that 30% discount on gold purchasing civilian units and just purchase every single settler every turn. And it's just like, it's absolutely insane. On top of getting navigation schools, which give you, uh, it replaces the campus. Um, sorry, it replaces the university and the campus, but you get extra science for every two coast or lake tiles in the city. I've had like plus 16 science navigation schools and it's like something ridiculous like they're they can be absolutely broken if you get them working correctly so that's why i'm saying that's why i haven't been b tier because it's one of those civs where if if you don't get him to work out he sucks you don't get any trade routes you don't get any of the cool things but if you do he is s tier so you're gonna, you're gonna have to average that out you have to you have to average it out because like i said portugal just be god awful or it could be broken so I feel like B tier is just like meeting in the middle there. It's like, okay, it's the healthy middle. He is a very strong Civ. If you have a game where you're playing like Pangea and you have like four to five cities that are coastal and the rest of them aren't, then you can use those coastal ones to like kind of make up for that and it makes him a good Civ. So I, I think B tier is still applicable for him. It, that's where I come in in that, that opinion. The final 10. Oh my God. I can't believe I'm already on the last 10 of these Civs. We are with Rome. We are Trajan of Rome, and this is a very B tier focused uh, ranking. But Trajan is uh, Trajan's a decent civ. Remember, this is not this is without game modes. I always recommend if you're gonna play Tra if you're gonna play a civ, you've never played civ before, play Rome, play Trajan of Rome. He is a uh, a very very He's a very non-forgiving Civ, I guess that's the word. He, he's a very forgiving Civ. You can kind of like mess up and do whatever you want. And he's going to, he's just going to be there for you. <laughs> he's going to be there for you. Uh, all roads lead to Rome is a really good ability. You get free roads from cities that are settled uh, uh, nearby him. I can't remember how much it is. Yeah, within uh, within trade route range of the capital, you get a road to it. Um, you get a free, all founded cities start with a free building. So it's a monument. If it's in the ancient era, uh, like all free cities get a monument. So you get culture for free. You get legions, which are a good swordsman unit. Uh, it gives you combat strength for anti kayak units as well as the bath is actually a really good district. It's a half cost district. Um, it also gives you amenities. If it's adjacent to a geothermal fissure, that's eh, pretty niche. Don't really care about that. Uh, I'm going to be building aqueducts i'm not building neighborhoods uh so i find trajan to be like one of those very similar to pound maker just like a catch-all be good civ can be really strong nothing incredibly overpowered about him he's just a strong good civ that allows you to do stuff whereas this boy right here julius caesar um i have him in c tier I think Caesar is okay only because he still gets Rome abilities. So you still get all roads lead to Rome. You get the Legion, you get the bath, but he, <laughs> Caesar, just like, I forgot to mention this with the unifier, just like unifier were obviously built to be played with game modes. He is obviously was made to be played with the barbarian clans game mode. So you can utilize his bonus of, uh, uh, Veni oh, it's Weni Weedy Weechi. Weni Weedy, Weni Weedy Weechi, where you get the gold for conquering a city or 100 gold for destroying a barb outpost. That also includes raiding the outpost with barb clans mode. He's obviously made for that game mode, whereas Unifier is obviously made for, like, zombie mode, right? Like, it's the only thing he's good for. Tra uh, Caesar has, like, he has the Rome ability, so he's still decent, but it's, like, it's not as good as Trajan. Like Trajan is by far and above because he literally gets monuments for free, right? Also, I realized I made the C tier like super close together. So it looks like there's B tier is uh, 
is a, way massive and a lot bigger than the the C tier one, but it's because they're all close together down here in C tier because it was starting to get top heavy. So back to what I was saying about Trajan versus uh, versus Caesar. Trajan gets stuff for free, and like I know that there was a video of Ursa Ryan doing. Uh, as well as Potato doing those, like, crazy fast, like, well, the Marathon one, I think the Marathon one's, like, a little disingenuous because it's, like, okay. Obviously, Ro it's, like, it's like he's built for Marathon Barb Clans mode, and, like, that's it. Uh, and if you don't play with Barb Clans, remember, I'm looking about all of these without game modes. Without game modes, just vanilla. Then Caesar is just, like, okay, well, do I have Barb Clans around me? I don't. Okay, well, then I don't get to use my abilities. <laughs> Uh, I get gold for conquering a city for the first time. Okay, well, I have legions. Legions are a good unit, but unfortunately, as I mentioned before, because that good old, our best friend power creep means that we are only going to have legions for a short period of time. And once we get to men at arms, it, they aren't as good anymore. Now, if you can get the boost off with legions, then it's still good. That's why I still have Caesar into C tier because he's kind of similar to Alex, where if you get that going, it works out very well. He still is Rome, so he still gets the all roads lead to Rome. So he has movement, and you don't have to worry about it. But I mean, Trajan's just better. Like it's Trajan's better. Free monument. Okay, you get extra culture. You don't have to worry about. So now you have extra culture, which gets you through the civic tree, which means you can use the policy cards faster, which means you can use your production for other things like settlers or warriors or builders or whatever it is. You don't have to worry about monuments. Uh, free stuff is better than not free stuff. Words by Bose. Our other and final S tier leader. We have our boy, Peter of Russia. This one is probably no surprise to you guys. You know how I feel about Peter. Peter has been an S tier in every single time and even with the power creep that was added to this he still remains on top now i said you can make an argument whether or not peter is better than the kamai better than yongla and the reason why peter is so damn good every single time is because of the lavra now people have been, have been like well what if you don't spawn in tundra right because you obviously get the extra uh faith in production from spawning on tundra tiles and it's like, okay, yeah, that's nice. You know, you get your Pantheon super fast. Even if you don't spawn on Tundra, the Lavra is a district that you can unlock with your first tech, meaning because it's a holy site, holy sites are in astrology. Astrology is a tech that you can work. It can be the first tech you ever work, and it can be boosted if you find a uh, natural wonder nearby. So if you have a natural wonder nearby, you can get a Lavra unlocked as fast as you're working like mining or pottery or whatever it is that means you can get your lavra down by like turn i don't know we'll just we'll just by to be fair we'll say like turn 12 or 13 so you start working on your lavra 12 or 13 it only costs 27 production by that point you should be able to finish your lavra in about four turns you have your lavra finished by turn we'll just say like we'll be fair we'll say lavra finished like turn 17 or 18 now, since you've got your Lavra done, you're getting plus two great profit points per turn, meaning you you should have your religion before turn 30. Like, I, like, we'll say max turn 33, turn 32, but before turn 30, that's, in, like, that's so insane. Not only once you get, once you finish your Lavra, you get, start getting great rider points with your shrine, great artist points with your temple, and then great musician points when you get your worship building in there. It's insane. Now, if you do spawn on Tundra, like you should as Peter, you place down your Lavra, you have a half-cost Lavra, and your Pantheon is Desert... No, Desert Folklore. Uh, what's the Tundra one? Um, uh, not Desert Folklore. It's the other one that you get from Tundra. Uh, da -da 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 Dance of the Aurora, where Holy Sites gain plus one faith from adjacent Tundra tiles. Since you're playing as Peter... You're more often than not going to spawn in Tundra. So now you'll be able to get Lavras, which are plus five, plus six, plus uh, eight sometimes uh, adjacency because of Dance of the Aurora. Then you go Work Ethic. And now from like <laughs> at turn like 30, you have <laughs> you have a plus 16 Holy Site in like four or five cities. Um because of dance of the aurora that's like almost guaranteed whereas like you know my case with like theodora is that uh you're pro that's probably not gonna be 100 percent guaranteed right whereas 
with Peter, it almost is every single time. And you're going to be able to get a Golden Age because of your Lavra. Uh, and since your Lavra is more than likely, since you're going to probably get Dance of the Aurora because you can get your Pantheon first. Because if you settle on Tundra, you're going to have like plus three faith per turn in the beginning of the game. So you get Dance of the Aurora. Then you get your Lavra. That's plus four Holy Sight. Then you get your Religion. So you're almost guaranteed to get a Golden Age in the classical era and you're going to be getting so much faith per turn that it's like all right monumentality golden age time to blow this game wide open and you just faith by a settler every like five turns it's peter's peter's insane there's a reason why they had to nerf peter in that 2020 patch because before with the lavra you gained plus one writer artist and musician points per turn once you finished your uh, once you finish the Lavra and every single game you would play and Peter was the AI, you'd see him have like 20 great people just like floating around because he didn't have room to use them. So he's Peter's broken. Peter's insane. If, if monumentality golden ages did not exist, this would probably change. Peter would probably be a tier and not S tier, but because he is, because it, it does exist, and he gains so much great people points per turn and faith per turn, and almost has a guaranteed like plus six, plus five holy sight, it's like it's an easy call to make him S tier. I feel like there shouldn't be any extra explanation with that because once you get that established, you can do whatever you want. And this is like he. Tr this is what I truly mean by you can do whatever you want. You want to go science go science you want to go faith religion go religion you want to go domination sure faith by every single dom game or dom unit in the game by going grandmaster's chapel you want to go culture that's exactly what his kit wants to do you can do anything that you want with him because he's so strong and that's why i have these three in the in s tier because you can do the same thing with jay and you can do the same thing with yongla i still think peter might be a little bit better than both of them but it's there's arguments to be made for all three so Peter's S tier, I feel like there shouldn't be... Everyone should agree with that. If you don't think Peter's S tier, then you're playing this game wrong. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm just going to say it. I'm sorry. You're playing this game wrong, and, you, and uh, uh, yeah, I'm right. I'm just joking. Am I? Eh. Eh. We are feckless idiots. It's Robert time. Uh, Robert the Boose. Robert the Goose. Bruce's Goose. Bruce's Gooses. Come down to Bruce's Gooses. Robert's a good Civ. I have him in B tier. I find him along the same lines as Korea, where he is a good Civ who can get things going really well. Um, I don't generally like his uh, his bonus of War of Liberation to get the production in the cities, but but you can you can stack those War of Liberations and get an insane amount of production. Now, the only problem is that War of Liberation isn't guaranteed. So there have been games where I've played as Scotland and I've never been able to declare a War of Liberation. Uh, it's cool. If you can stack it with Warlord's Throne to do these crazy fast science victories, it works out really well, but it's super RNG dependent. Um, whereas his other stuff, Happy Cities gain plus 5% science and plus 5% production and gain extra scientist points in their campuses and engineer and, and engineers now that's very useful and you can get that super early on in the game if you trade for an extra amenity uh like get an extra luxury resource you can get that extra five percent very fast and that's why whenever you look in the game and you see someone's like gaining a lot of great people points per turn in both uh scientists and engineers you're like that's that's probably robert it's pretty easy to figure out uh, golf courses are, are cool to give you extra amenities. Um, I don't really care about the gold and like culture. I just, the amenity plus two amenities is super nice. Uh, Highlanders is another sieve. You can do recon only, um, stuff, but I always find Highlanders to be like, I don't care about them unless I'm doing recon only because by that point in the game, it replaces the Ranger and you just don't, you don't care about recon units at that point. So they're kind of like whatever, but the Scottish enlightenment is, a uh, is a pretty good um it's a pretty good bonus yeah and ecstatic cities double that so you get an extra 10 percent science in production so not only are you getting the ecstatic bonuses of 20 percent to all yields you're also getting the extra 10 percent from scottish enlightenment so 
not too much to talk about there. Pretty straightforward. Good Civ. The most divisive Civ lately in all of my videos, mostly because I've just been talking about how she is not Gilgamesh and you can't befriend her. Even if people say you can, you can't. You cannot befriend her turn one like you can Gilgamesh. It's not a guarantee. She is, she's C tier. She's another C tier Civ. Uh, Scythia, Tamaris. She is a good domination Civ with horses. She do like to build the light cavalry. Uh, anytime you build a light cavalry or a Sokka horse archer, you get in a second unit of that. So you can do some super fast early game rushes of going into horses and then just overwhelming the AI with like 30 horses at the beginning of the game. Obviously not that much, but... Uh, and Sokka horse archers, they only have an attack range of one, but they uh, you don't care about zone of control and you can just completely destroy units. Now, they don't do anything to cities, but you can just use Sokka horse archers to kill units and then use your cavalry, light cavalry, to destroy cities before they get walls. Um, obviously, once they get walls, then that's kind of, you know, you have light calves. Uh, her Kurgan... I don't care about, I don't, I don't really care about this, uh, this, this production. Now you can use it to place, since you are Scythia, you're probably going to have horses nearby. If you go animal husbandry first, you unlock horses, you start to, you build a pasture, you build a Kurgan, that Kurgan gives you extra faith and you can get your Pantheon pretty fast. Um, that is like a good part about them, but other than that, I don't really care. I have Scythia C tier. I, th I think she's just a good solid C tier Civ. She does excel at some really good things, but most most of it is just like, it's it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Ah! That's how I, that's how I feel about Spain. Um, Philip is a B tier Civ. I should put these a little bit closer like I have the C tier ones here. Philip Philip's a B tier Civ. He is not higher on this list because like a lot of civs that aren't higher on this list, he is a little bit too dependent on things like, you guessed it, continental splits. Um, the extra yields that he gets from uh, being on a uh, on an extra continent, which is the the gold faith in production, um, it does it. It's it's uh, very dependent on a continental split. Uh, that was a cool thing that they added. I like that. I thought that was pretty neat. Um, I also like the fact that whenever you settle a city that's not on your continent, you get like an extra builder. Like I was like, oh, that's a nice little buff that, that encourages you to go expand. I will say missions are a very good building. Uh, you get the you get plus two faith and then extra faith in food and production if it's on a different continent than your capital, as well as science for every adjacent campus and holy site. So what you do is like you want to settle. If you're, if you're on a continental split, you want to settle on a city, like, if, if you can, like, say you have a ton of room over here that has expansion, and you put you you put your capital on one side of the continental split, then you expand on the other side of it, and you place down missions, and you gain a lot of yields. You gain a ton of yields from that, and that's where he is super strong. Um, but if you can't do that... It kind of limits, or you don't have a continental split. It kind of limits what he can do. Uh, he's still pretty strong, but I not as strong as not as strong as putting him up, up into A tier. So I, I have Spain's in B tier. Not too much to say about that. It's pretty straightforward. Gilgamesh, best friend. Sorry guys, he's still F tier. <laughs> I love Gilgamesh. He is our best friend. That's why we have him as best friend because. He, he, you can befriend him turn one. Every, th he's the only Civ, the only one that you can befriend on turn one, no matter what. If you meet him on a turn, like say the turn, you hit next turn, the turn's rolling over, you meet him. And then once that turn rollover finishes and it says that he dislikes you, you could still befriend him no matter what. Always is Gilgamesh, no matter what. I find that Gilgamesh is a better ally than playing as him because if he is your ally, you gain extra combat strength bonus as well as being an ally. Um, 
I find that one of his other main abilities too is that with heroes and legends, you gain extra production on claiming heroes and they have 20% lifespan. But this is not, we're talking about no game modes here. And so that kind of be like, oh, you made a, you have a, you have a sieve that relies on game modes. I don't really like that that much. Um, whenever you capture a barb outpost, you get a tribal ward village, tribal village reward, but that's also RNG dependent. Um, cigarettes are okay. War carts and civ six are great in multiplayer and in deity AI are absolutely god awful. The reason why I'm saying that is because you really have to spawn within like four tiles of another sieve. You have to be able to get a bunch of uh, war carts out. And if you are able to attack the AI with two to three war carts before they get walls, you're going to you're going to completely overwhelm them. But once they start getting walls, once they start getting warriors and archers, there's just you there's there's no they don't you just lose. You've just spent 30, 40 turns building war carts. Now you're so far behind, there's nothing you can do, and you're just going to get war declared on, and you're, you're going to die. Um, ziggurats are okay. Plus two science, plus one culture if it's placed next to a river. The way that I wish Gilgamesh was made was with Sucratax Sumeria rework. Sucratax Sumeria rework. Let me pull it up here. is probably the best yeah sucratax sumer rework it's probably the best way that i've seen a rework of sumeria because the way that sucratax talks about it is like the biggest issue with sumeria is that they've never felt as like the cradle of civilization right that's the whole point of sumeria they're the cradle of civilization it's where civilization started it's like you know all these big massive cities because of all these farms that are booming and stuff like that and that's what sucratax was saying so he, they said Civ has always been an extension of Gilgamesh with Ziggurats thrown in so that they fixed it. The the ability, the Sucratact rework that Sumer proposes, that it's a great mod. If you haven't played it, go play with this mod because it's like, it makes Sumeria a good Civ. Uh, the unique ability of Sumeria is newly founded cities begin with plus one extra population. So your cities start off with two population. Your farms adjacent to a river give plus one science next to the city signer or plus one faith next to a ziggurat. Uh, you also get a unique unit that replaces the heavy chariot. Um, it's not as, it's not as powerful as a war cart, but it's cheaper than a war cart. Uh, also your ziggurat is a little bit different. Um, you get plus one science and plus one science for every adjacent farm. So that's similar. Uh, I believe, hold on. Let me look at the old ziggurat. Sorry. Plus one science, or plus one science if it's adjacent to two farms. So that's a little bit different. You want to put ziggurats, then farms around it. Then you get plus one faith for each adjacent district, and then plus one amenity next to a city center. They cannot be placed to another ziggurat, though. So think of them like chateaus, for example. Um, you, st you still get the barbarian outpost tribal village reward stuff, but you can also purchase war carts, battering rams, siege units, and melee units with faith early on. So you kind of want to build ziggurats next to farms, next to uh, next to rivers, and next to your city center. That allows you to utilize getting some early faith in the in the game and to buy units. That's so, like I feel like that's such a better Gilgamesh than this one here because this one just feels like build war cart. If war cart work, good extra damage. If no war cart work, end your game. That's literally how it feels like playing Gilgamesh. Um, and yeah, there's like, no, you don't get any pe penalties on declaring, uh, like you don't get warmonger penalties and stuff like that. I just like, that's just stuff doesn't matter. He's Samaria just feels so underpowered. And remember, like I said, this is versus deity AI. It's so underpowered that this is a, this is another really clear example of a fantastic multiplayer Civ, but on single player deity AI is just like, why am I even playing with this? I would just much rather play the modded the modded version than playing Gilgamesh. Sorry. I still love Gilgamesh. He's my best friend, but he's bad. Christina. People are going to get mad at this one. Um, no, nah, just kidding. Christina's in C tier. Uh, Christina's just fine. She, she like, you know what you want to do with Christina. She doesn't like really have any 
awfulness to her in, in the early game. Like, she doesn't have a great early game. She literally has nothing that helps her in the early game. Uh, you get, like, some extra Diplo for getting great units. You get some extra great, like, engineer points from factories and scientist points. Um, you also get the Queen's Bibliotech, which replaces... Uh, I think it's no, it's a unique building of the, in the government tier two government plaza. So gives you extra great writer points per turn. It gives you like slots as well for great works of art, great works of music slots. So she is fantastic for when you want to do cultural things with great works. Um, and that's it. That's kind of really it. Uh, like you, you get. I mean, the open air museum is pretty cool, like culture and tourism, but it's not. It's really not like fan. I don't know. It it's it's not a great talent improvement. It's okay. The Corollian, it's okay. It replaces the Pike and Shot, which I always thought was kind of weird, but it's not. It's not really as good as uh. It, it's not really like I. You generally don't want to be going anti cav units in any sense of the game at all in Civ Six. Unfortunately, you really don't want to build into anti cav. Uh. Oh, there's really not to talk, much to talk about with Christina. The auto theming, I guess, is probably the biggest thing. Is that if you have a building that has at least three great work slots or a wonder with at least two great work slots, they're automatically themed. So you don't have to worry about trying to theme stuff. That's probably her strongest ability. Is that way you can get all the theming bonuses with without having to worry about it. Um, but she only does one thing and one thing good. And that is culture through great works. And I think that's why I bring her down into C tier instead of anywhere else. Because it's just like, yeah, we know what you're going to do. We know how that, how you're going to do it. And outside of that, you don't really do anything else that great. So C tier for Christina. Sweden's, Sweden's in C tier. Sorry. sorry. Vietnam is another Civ that was subject to some power creep. Uh, I had her in A tier. I'm bringing Vietnam into B tier now. I Vietnam can be really strong, and she has the potential to be a very strong Civ. But I find Vietnam's dependencies, I guess is the right word, to be kind of her downfall. Right? Uh, Vietnam Batru requires you to build her uh, districts on features, like uh, have to be placed on woods on marsh, on rainforests. So you can't, there there have been times where I've like, wow, I literally can't place a district anywhere right now, except when I do, it's like on a, on, I get one adjacency, so you don't really get a lot of adjacency from it. Now you can build woods with medieval fairs instead of conservation, so it's pretty fast to being able to build woods if you need to, but I find that sometimes it's just, it's, it's kind of hard. Now you do get to get the extra science, culture, or production, depending on what type of feature you place the district on. Um, her Void Chien are an incredibly strong unit. Uh, they can move after attacking. So they replace the crossbow. Um, you, you move in, attack, and then move away, which is uh, I think is an incredibly strong unit. And their unique encampment is a very... I, I like her encampment because it you kind of use it as like a mini government plaza where you place it down and you don't have to worry about placing it on marshes and stuff like that. You place it down in the middle of all the other districts you want to district around. And you, you treat it almost like Hojo does or, or Tokugawa with Meiji Restoration. Uh, you get culture from every adjacent district. So you can kind of make up for some extra culture stuff. It's, it's cool. It's a unique, unique little uh, encampment. And so I have Vietnam and B tier. They can be incredibly strong. But I find sometimes that... The limitations of her district placement brings her down a little bit too much, and that's why I have her into B tier instead of A this time. And on the final, final, final ranking of Civilization VI leaders ever, we have the number one music in the entire game, the Zulu, Shaka, and I am putting Shaka into B tier. Shaka is another Civ that... Once again, power creep comes in. Since he does what he does super well, it's domination. But after, outside of that, he really doesn't do anything else. Um, you get uh, the Impy, which is an incredibly unique, incredibly strong, unique unit uh, that is unlocked with military tic tacs, military tactics, 
instead of getting a pikeman it gives you extra combat strength versus light heavy and range calves um you also get extra experience and then you also get the akanda which is a replacement for the encampment it's half cost gives you extra housing as well as 25 percent faster training of cores and armies now uh, it also allows you to build cores and armies without the military academy building so you can just click the to build uh, cores and armies so once you get to impi you should be able to build impi cores and MP cores are kind of going to destroy everything in that stage of the game. Um, but if for some reason you're unable to get domination going, if you're unable to get things rolling with Shaka, he kind of falls into that same spear as Alexander does or as the Ottoman do. And you're kind of like left behind being like, what do I do now? I have to play catch up from now on. And so you have to kind of go to the science route or the, or whatever, and that's why I have Shaka into B tier. He is a good Civ, but there are some limitations on what you want to do. Wow, B is actually kind of getting crowded up here. There are some limitations on what you want to do, and if you don't get past those limitations or if you can't do what you want to do, then you're kind of stuck with just a bunch of impies. Now, because his strength of focus is so strong, because of what he wants to do is so strong, it brings him back up, like like I said, that's what, you know, the strength is focused and the synergy of everything he wants to do. That does bring his score up a little bit higher. But everything else, it's kind of, it, everything else is, it's he's so linear that he only wants to do one thing and one thing only, and that's domination. Uh, so that's where I have Shaka, B tier. There you have it. The finale. The final, 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 final Civilization Leader tier list. It's done. We're here. It's complete. This is a very, very, very long video. Um, but since it's the final one, I did want to take a little bit extra time with my explanations for civs. Uh, and then I did for the previous ones, you know, and before the comments too long, didn't watch. Uh -huh. uh, I hope I did it justice. Uh, as I stated before, some of the rankings were a little bit harder to do because of the, uh, once again, saying that word power creep that was added to this game. I, for me, I feel like everyone's kind of in the correct place. With with the power creep that was added, it obviously, you know, gave us a, a ton of civs in the B and C tier. Um, and it was kind of hard to place civs that weren't in those tiers, like below, because you look at them and you're like, these are objectively good civs. But there are some civs that just do it way better than other civs. Um, I, I definitely think that... I mean, if you look at it here, it's just, I don't know. It's kind of hard to be like, I, I think everything is fairly in the right place. Um, can you swap a few of them based around play style? Like, sure. Maybe some opinions change different, but this is kind of how I feel about all of the leaders in Civ 6. It's very obvious that I value early game faith snowballing more than others. Um, like I mentioned before, early game monumentality golden ages are a thing in this game. But I mean, even with that, I don't know. If you disagree, I mean, you're wrong. No, I'm just I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I would love to hear what you guys have to think about this. There, It's not like super similar to my previous one. There are ones that go up and down, but the, the ideas are still the same on why some civs are stronger than others. Um, it's, I, I can't believe this is the final tier list that I'm making for Civilization VI. Uh, I could do the wonders again. I don't know if I really want to. Nothing's really changed from that. It feels like I just started making these lists and that the fact that this is like the final, final, final tier list for Civilization VI is kind of bittersweet. Uh, I hope that it means that Civ VII is around the corner or whatever the next iteration of Civ is. Uh, no, before you ask, I don't have any insider knowledge. Like, yes, I have like friends in the devs. No, I don't. I don't know anything. So I not say I don't know when it's coming out. Um, while this is the end of this video, I wanted to talk about something if you didn't watch my previous video that I mentioned, is that my content is going to be changing. Uh, you can find that video here, and I'll also link it down in the description below. But I'm no longer going to be making only Civilization VI content. Uh, in the previous video, I talked about how I still will be making Civ con VI content, but alongside of that, it's going to be Civ adjacent games like Crusader Kings, for example, or City Skylines, um, other 4X games, maybe some like Roller Coaster Tycoon. All my style is not going to change. 
I'm going to be making challenge like videos. You know how I do the silly challenges like uh, no campus science victory or turn 87 is Ludwig. If you enjoy si uh, other channels like the Spiffing Brit, Ambiguous Amphibian, RT Game, Call Me Kevin, let's let's game it out. Channels like that, then you'll be familiar with what I'm doing. Uh, but it's not just going to be Civilization 6 anymore. I wanted to give a little bit of shout out again if you didn't watch the previous video, which I get. Um, in case people have missed it, but I would highly suggest watching that video because I talk about why I'm moving that in direction, the, the burnout I'm experiencing with Civ 6, and how I just feel like I'll be happier making content that way. So just want to talk about that really quickly. But there it is. This is the actual end of the video. Uh, um, I, I hope you guys enjoyed this. Uh, I hope you understood the reasonings behind the rankings. Um, I want to hear what your guys' thoughts on it. You know, maybe disagree with uh, some of the things you want. Ludwig to be S tier, for example. I, I don't know. Uh, please let me know, though, below. This is this is the final, final, final tier list rankings. And now I know there's somebody be, people will be comparing this with, like, Ursa's tier list, for example. And I feel like our tier lists are completely different because Ursa's tier list is based on situations in the game, whereas I feel like my tier list is just pure factual numerical basis on ranking things and not being like, well, in this situation, I'd rather have this versus this. And I feel like there are two different types of ranking styles. So don't be like, well, both said this, so he's obviously better. Well, Ursa said this, it was, no, like, they're just two different tier lists. Um, just wanted to throw that out there. Uh, either way, this is the end of the video. Uh, I want to shout out to all my Patreon and Coffee supporters as well as my YouTube members. If you wanted to support me financially, you can. I do have a Patreon as well as a Coffee. Uh, you can throw a few bucks my way, but don't feel obligated to. This all of my content is free. Um, I am trying to possibly raise a new computer because I'm starting to get pretty outdated now. So if you you know that would help, but it's no obligation. Um, I do appreciate all the support though. It's it's incredibly nice and I don't expect it at all. Uh, but if you do enjoy my content, please consider subscribing to the channel. That's a free way to do it. Click the button, click the bell, get to see a large number go burr. And we get to see Dave get closer to 100K. So um, that's it for me. This is the final, 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 final Civilization VI leader tier list and the final Civ tier list that I will be making. I want to thank you all for watching. And I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.